Hi, everyone. We'll begin in about 10 minutes. If you don't hear anything, that's okay. Uh, we just muted everyone.
James, do we have a, a YouTube live stream happening? Oh, it does. Okay. So I can get a link, I guess, yeah. from here. Great. Yes, we have a link. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can email it we'll... to you guys as well. Uh, if you can post it on the site, that would be great. On the website? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll do that. I'll tweet, tweet it as well. We'll get started in two minutes. Okay, so it's 8.30, um, we're gonna get started. Um, so I just wanna start by welcoming everybody to um, the machine learning and computational biology meeting. Um, for those of you who, um, who don't know, uh, MLCB uh, has been around actually since 2004. Uh, it used to be um, a NeurIPS workshop. In fact, one of the longest running NeurIPS workshops. Um, starting 2019, um, we basically we became, sorry, just give me a second. Um, so uh, as I was saying, um, MLCB has been around since 2004 and uh, until 2017, it was basically an official Europe's workshop. Uh, in 2019, we uh, basically became an independent conference. Uh, we were mostly co-located with NeurIPS. Uh, this year due to COVID, uh, of course, we have to be virtual. And so that's what we did. Um, we've had an amazing turnout. So thanks to everybody who um, submitted uh, abstracts and who registered for the conference. Um, we have at least a thousand people uh, registered for this meeting. So that's that's been an incredible turnout. In fact, we can't host everybody on the uh, on the Zoom webinar, and so we actually have a live um, uh, YouTube a live stream going on at the same time. Um, so I want to thank, uh, firstly, all the co-organizers, um, David Knowles, uh, Suin Lee, Sarah Mustafavi, Jarrah Kwan, and, and James Zhao. Um, and just to give you a few uh, statistics, as I mentioned, um, we have uh, about 1,131 participants registered for the meeting. Uh, we had a pretty record turnout of 91 submissions for papers from which we had to somehow, um, they were all peer reviewed and we eventually selected the top 14 for oral presentations. 
and we have nine spotlight uh, talks and 39 posters, which will happen at the Gather Town uh, site, um, which you can get to uh, from right here. Okay. Um, so just a few other discussion points for the uh, for the meeting today. Uh, please post your uh, questions um, via the Q and A uh, section in Zoom. Uh, uh, Please don't put questions in chat. It's much easier to handle the Q and A uh, through the uh, two questions through the Q and A section of Zoom, uh, and and uh, the moderators we will read out your questions, so you won't get a chance to actually ask them um, with your voice. Type them out uh, while the talk is going on, and at the end of the talk, we will um, we will curate these questions and try to get them answered by the speakers. Um, have I missed anything, James or David? Sounds good. Okay, excellent. So let's jump right in. We have um, a fantastic schedule for today. Um, super excited about uh, three amazing keynotes. And also um, on Tuesday, we're gonna have a panel discussion, which is also gonna be super interesting. Um, so we'll start off with our first uh, keynote speaker. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Aviv Regev. Uh, Aviv needs obviously no introduction. Uh, she uh, is currently a computational biologist and executive vice president uh, of Genentech Research and Early Development. But most of you probably know her as a professor at the, MIT, at the Broad Institute for MIT and Harvard, where she was uh, just until a few months ago uh, and at the Department of Biology. Um, Aviv has been at the forefront of, of genomics and computational biology uh, for forever. She has obviously um, uh, done amazing work in the field of uh, computational models for gene regulation in the early days, uh, and more recently has been um, really a leader in uh, pioneering efforts for single cell genomics, both experimental and computational techniques. Um, she has a uh, uh, she has been awarded a ton of really uh, great uh, awards for her research, including the Overton Prize, the ISCB uh, Innovator Award, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, um, the, Welco, uh, the Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Award, and more recently, uh, just in 2019, she was uh, elected as a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so we are super, super excited to have Aviv with us today, and she's going to present her keynote talk on uh, design for inference uh, for tissue biology. Thanks so much, Arif. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Just give me one second. Where is it? Can you see it? Yes, perfect. And now I put it in uh, full screen mode. Can you still see it? Yes, it looks uh, And I apologize, there's some noise in the background, um, but it will go away very soon. Okay, so it's a Great uh, pleasure to be here today. And also I want, I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a lot easier to go to meetings these days than in the past, um, since you don't go actually anywhere. But I did, I did do the new thing that I do, oops, that I do when I, uh, when I uh, go to these meetings is that I try to quickly look at the list of participants, which is the equivalent of who you run into in the coffee break, I guess, these days. And so a lot of familiar names of you know, old friends and, and also new ones. So um, thank you for joining us. And so I'll start with my disclosures. I'm a co-founder and equity holder in Celsius Therapeutics and Immunitas. And until July 31st, I was an SAB member with either cash or equity compensation in Thermo Fisher, Neogen and Cirrus. And since August 1st, I'm an employee of Genentech and Roche and my lab is moving there. But all the work that I'm showing here, naturally given the amount of time that passed, which is very short, still comes from my uh, lab at MIT, the Broad and HDMI. And so uh, biology is the integration of multiple levels of organization and the fundamental unit of life is of course the cell. But um, in multicellular organism, the way that cells function really depends on the balance of the interactions between them. So we have, um, they, they form these direct interactions. These are assisted by the tissue structures that they form. And then they assemble the organs that eventually account for the organism's physiology. Now, tissues are complex, they're structured and they're dynamic cellular ecosystems. And um, in this way, they actually maintain this remarkable feat known as homeostasis, which of course, when it breaks in different ways, we end up with disease. 
Now, to accomplish homeostasis, cells need to somehow join in their action. And they do this through a process of division of labor that really characterizes multicellular organisms between the cells that are kind of the core cell of the tissue, sometimes known as the primary cell or as the parenchymal cell. So for example, alveolar epithelial cells in the lung or, um, or neurons in the brain together with accessory cells, which are basically all these other cells that are in the tissue, the stroma, the neuron, the, you know, the stroma, the glia, the, um, the immune cells and so on, which help those cells. So in the case of say an alveolar epithelial cell, this would be the alveolar macrophage and many other alveolar cells. Now, dissecting tissue function really requires us to understand, um, to, to do molecular and cellular experiments that would give us mechanism and genetics in order to obtain causality. And so, as is often the case in biology, structure tends to go together with function in ways that are interesting to us as biologists. And so the way that cells are organized physically in the tissue in these spatial and histological patterns can really reflect their joint functionality. And so I will call these things histological modules. And to dissect tissue structure, we also need to know certain things. We need to know the molecules and the cells and how they're organized histologically, which is another thing that we typically measure experimentally. Now, what's difficult about these kinds of relationships, say from genes to cells and from cells to tissue, is that they're not linear, um, either structurally or functional. And so at least until recently, if we wanted to relate molecules to histology, we needed to measure these molecules directly in situ. And for the functional question, if we wanted to genetically, if we needed to, you know, genetically manipulate any combinations of genes and measure the outcome, because we didn't know how to predict those. And so today, I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which I think algorithms can help in thinking about both the practical and the conceptual challenges of tissue biology. I'm not going to have an answer for all of the problems that I opened up, but I'm going to highlight several of the ways in which our own lab and other labs, I believe, are trying to tackle some of these challenges. And I'm going to cover three kinds of examples. The first is how to define new experimental modalities based on algorithmic ideas. The second is how computational methods can help address the limitations of current experimental modalities and also enhance and integrate data so that we have a better understanding of how the different pieces come together. And the third, and I think the most interesting one, but the, also the earliest one, is how we can help use these approaches in order to make new biological discoveries and give us concept a conceptual framework with which to study tissues. So I'm going to start with new experimental modalities and, and remind you that today, um, you know, if we um, want to know where cells are, we typically have to measure them in situ. And there's a range of approaches for how to do this, both at the RNA and at the protein level, but they all have trade-offs. And so one of the key trade-offs is between resolution and genomic scale. Many of the high resolution methods rely on these predefined sets of probes or antibodies, but their number of probes and antibodies, or what I would call the number of measurement channels is usually limited because of instrumentation limitations most of all. And so several years ago, Brian Cleary, when he was a graduate student in the lab, suggested that maybe we shouldn't measure each gene individually and could still recover the information that we need. And so for example, if instead of measuring each gene separately in each sample, we could rely on approaches from compressed sensing to collect compressed measurements of gene expression and use a decompression algorithm to give us individual gene levels with some you know, theoretical guarantees that that should actually work. And so these ideas are used in other domains like signal processing, we can acquire, for example, compressed images. And this works well because images are structured and not random. And you know, gene expression is also very structured. This is not a new insight. It's been around since the very early days of functional genomics and actually since well before then from our knowledge of regulons. And so sets of genes can be co-regulated going up and down together in sets of samples. And these modules are used in different combinations by cells to give us eventually the cellular state that we observe. And so could we compress expression data as well? The reason that we wanted to go after this is that it would be very helpful. Because um, as I told you, there's many measurement methods that have a limited number of channels. So if each channel is used for just one gene or one protein, they can only measure maybe dozens of RNAs of proteins. But what if we could use the same 100 channels and get the level of 10,000 10, RNA or proteins instead? 
So how might we do this? For this, we introduce the idea of not measuring individual genes, but measuring the abundance of a smaller number of what I would call composite genes, where the composite gene is basically a linear combination of different gene abundances. And so theory suggests that we could view, choose the coefficients in this linear combination randomly. And specifically, we showed that they can even be binary. And that's important because for many activities, it doesn't matter exactly how you set the coefficients. But for experimental biology, for a lab implementation, binary coefficients are the easiest thing to do. They're just a summing up of whatever is your detection method for the individual, um, for the individual molecule. And so first, let's just imagine that we somehow can collect this kind of data, how should it apply in practice? Are my slides still advancing? Because I got a weird message on the screen. Do you see now a white slide and it just says yes. comparison yes. for transfer? Yes. Great, thanks. There's a little bit of a shuffling sound occasionally, but otherwise it's fine. Okay, I have no idea what the source of the shuffling sound is. Before I knew it, there was some work outside, but maybe, okay, I'm it's trying fine. to reposition my laptop. Hopefully that would help. Yeah, it's fine. It's good. Okay. So one option is, so, so, so imagine that we could make such measurements, how would we get individual gene levels from them? So one option is to use a little bit of training. So the idea is that we'll take say 5% of the full data that we would want to measure, and we would measure it fully, you know, full gene expression profiles. And we would use this data in order to find structure by fitting some model where the expression of the genes across the samples is going to be explained by a dictionary of gene modules and by the activity levels of the modules in the samples. And you can use different approaches to get something like this. You could use SVD, you could use sparse NMF. We tried both of them and we also developed our own algorithm that we called sparse module activity factorization or SMAF because um, it, was, uh, it required the model to be sparse in both the module dictionary and the module activities, and that is beneficial for decompression later on. Then imagine that we take the remaining 95% of the samples and we only obtain compressed measurements for them, which in this case we actually did with simulations first, and uh, we do this with random weights. And so we don't know anything about which compositions to use, we just use random composition. And then we use the module dictionary that we learned in order in, in the first step and the compressed measurements in order to predict the levels of um, individual genes or to decompress the data. And of course, if we did it in simulation, we can then compare the original and the decompressed data and see how well we did. I also want to point out that in principle, there is theory to suggest that we could also decompress compressed measurements without any training at all. That's called blind compressed sensing. And in biology, it would mean that we would infer the level of each gene, even if we've never seen a full profile, only compressed ones. So BCS, which is used in signal processing, requires you to make some assumptions on the, how the data basically is structured. And the kinds of assumptions that people have made for other problems in signal processing are not good biological assumptions. So instead, we made the assumption that samples that cluster together when in, in their compressed measurements likely activate the same kinds of modules, which is a sensible assumption given what we know about biology and gene regulation. And so Brian devised an algorithm that he called BCS SMAS that first clusters the, compared, the compressed samples, and then we search for small dictionaries of uh, modules per cluster, and then we concatenate them to generate the module dictionary, and this is the starting point for an iterative optimization on the modules and their activities. And so now we would ask whether all of these ideas could possibly work for biological data. And so, um, and so a couple of years ago, we showed that in theory, this should actually work. And we did it by simulating on either bulk or single cell RNA-seq data, taking full profiles, compressing them in simulation, applying the methods to them, getting decompressed results, and seeing what we do. And actually the first test that we did was without any decompression whatsoever. We just took the compressed profiles from on, generated on GTEx data, clustered them, and saw that we got the same clustering as we would get from full profiles. This is actually a theoretically expected result. We shouldn't be that surprised. The second was that we can correctly recover abundances after decompression. This example is from blind BCS, and we perform even better if we have the 5% of training data. And then finally, we also did it in the context of perturbed seq data because we thought that phenotyping perturbations on co in compressed regimes is particularly beneficial for screens where we have a very large number of experiments. And so more recently, we wanted to try and move this to practice. 
and to see if we can do this in the lab. And so we chose a great lab assay called HCR fish that can measure only a small number of individual RNAs, but at a very high resolution. And so the way that it works is that you do a series of uh, single molecule fish experiments in one section. And in each cycle, you measure three different channels, which typically would mean three different genes. And then you can do it through four or five rounds to get to the full number of genes that you can measure in this assay. And so in order to modify this to a compressed setting, we, um, we um, used a two-step design. In the first step, we did use training data from single cell RNA-seq, not from a spatial measurement technique. That allowed us to find the gene modules and define gene compositions. And we reasoned that you know, doing single cell RNA-seq today on a piece of tissue is actually not that difficult. Why not use it if you're allowed? Then we're going to use our channels to perform composite images, imaging of these combinations. We will recover the module activities, and then we will decompress the image to the level of individual genes. Because in imaging, it is difficult for us to get to large numbers of genes. And so to do the compressed measurements in what we call composite in situ imaging or SICE, um, we measure each color in each cycle. In each color in each cycle, we're going to measure an aggregate of probes for multiple transcripts together, simply by using probes with a single color that target multiple genes. And you can see that the genes repeat themselves in these different composites or combinations. And so we did this together with Fei Chen's lab, and we measured nine composite images of 37 genes in the mouse cortex. And if you know the mouse cortex, this is not like any individual gene would look like because these are the composite measurements and you see very little pattern apparent to the eye. Okay, um, I have to actually, now my computer is trying to restart itself. So give me a second before that actually happens, which would be a very bad idea. Okay, my apologies for all these. Can you still see my slides? Thank yeah, you. Looks good. Thank and can you. you see the next slide now with an encoder and a decoder? Great. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. I don't know. The Zoom is really conspiring against me this morning. Okay. So now we need to decompress these compressed images to get real images of, of or images of real of real individual genes. And we had actually two approaches for this. The first one that is not on this slide is that we first segment the cells and then we decompress the expression per cell. So that's more similar to what I showed you before and really just relies on expression levels. And we do this by estimating the gene module activities and the individual gene abundances. But what is more interesting from my perspective was that we also developed this segmentation-free decompression, which is just based on a convolutional autoencoder that would infer individual gene abundances at each pixel in the image. So here we do the decompression from 10 to 37 channels, so 10 composite to 37 genes in the encoded latent space, and then we decode those images with the decoder. And so that's a different approach and it has some benefits. The first one is that you don't have to segment upfront, which is a painful problem. You don't have to spot detect, which has benefits in the imaging, which I'll get to later. And the third piece is that you can actually benefit from all sorts of patterns that exist in the image itself that reflect on the dependencies between genes. Okay, and what happens when we actually use this? And so when we decompress, we get these very precise and accurate patterns, which I'm showing here for three genes, SST, VLC17A7, and VIP. You should realize that none of these three images was actually acquired as is under the microscope. They were only parts of different composites. There were only parts of different composites. And so um, the pattern though fits really well. First of all, when we compare it to the Allen Brain Atlas, which you're seeing on the left, but also when we individually measured these genes on the same actual sections at the end of the process. Remember that this is a cyclical process. So you can leave the very last step not used for composites, but used for individual genes, which we do repeatedly through multiple cycles. And as a result of that, we have a ground truth to compare to. And so the red signal is directly measured. The green signal is recovered from decompression and the yellow pixels are the ones that overlap. And you can see that the overlap is really nice down to the pixel level. And then finally, we extended this to a much larger data set of 12 coronal sections, 118, 180 millimeters squared, almost 500,000 cells, 37 genes in 11 compositions. And um, we didn't just use genes that were good, you know, cell type markers, but also genes that were characteristics of cell states. And we got a good reconstruction after the decompression, both of the cell type and of the cell state genes, which were mostly immediate early genes. And we also recovered cell cluster labels and spatial patterns. And because we multiplex the genes, 
we don't need to do spot detection. And as a result of that, we can use just 20x imaging. So overall, we gain 100 to 300x in efficiency. And so this idea can, in principle, be applied in a very similar way to proteins too. These are some results from simulations, which we did with data in collaboration with Ron Germain, but we have not yet op optimized this ex um, experiment. And so to summarize this first part, I showed you that because gene expression is really structured, we should be able to use compressed sensing by measuring random composite measurements and then decompressing them. This requires, though, shared regulation. And so if you're looking at things like, say, assist EQTL, where a gene is very specially and separately regulated, this is not going to work. But very nicely for us, most of gene regulation is actually shared, so it seems to work quite well in practice. We can decompress from 200x if we use a 5% training set, and we can even apply decompression to compressed measurements blindly, and so with no training at all. And we applied this experimentally, and we showed, um, in this way, we showed compressed imaging for RNA, and we have this nice segmentation-free decompression method, but also a more segmentation-based method, and they have kind of pros and cons, each of them. And so in addition to getting fourfold more multiplexing, and that will grow the more measurement channels you have, we can also work at much lower spatial resolution. So overall, we get this 100-fold to 300-fold gain, uh, which is very important in experiments that are costly and time and take a lot of time. And so this point that algorithms should lead to new experimental methods and design is also behind um, another method, DNA microscopy, that I'm only going to mention very briefly. And so this was pioneered by Joshua Weinstein, who now has a lab at the University of Chicago, but used to be a postdoc with Fang Zhang and myself. And um, today, if you actually want to measure molecules in tissue, you have to choose between one of two imaging modalities. The first is optics, um, going back you know, to the 1600s. And the other is to physically capture things from a known location that you track along and later on you can reconstruct, you know, maybe works in this way, for example. And so Josh came up with a third imaging modality um, in which, which is both optics free and registration free and is really just based on a standalone biochemical reaction. So really briefly, he codes every transcript with the UMI in situ, and then he encodes the proximity between transcripts by what he calls a unique event identifier or a UEI. So these are unique barcodes that would form when a pair of diffusing copies of two distinct molecules are going to meet each other. If you let this diffusion happen on the tissue or in the cell culture in situ. And then after sequencing, you can decode an image from these UEI frequencies that are associated with each pair of UMIs because you're gonna rely on the fact that given diffusion in a structured environment of cells, the more proximal the sources were, the higher the probability that there would be more UEIs that would form between their you know, diffusing fronts of their copies. And so Josh demonstrated DNA microscopy that it works well for small and large gene signatures and even transcriptome wide. And so algorithms can really modify existing modalities or they can suggest entirely new kinds of experiments. And DNA microscopy is an example of this, you know, optics and registration free method, just a standalone chemical reaction. The resolution depends on the sequencing depth. You can think of the read as your photon. It actually works out in the math that way. And we think that it would be really important for these mutation rich types of tissues like tumors and immune systems. And okay, so this was the first part. It's about how you can think beyond what we can do experimentally by taking an algorithmic approach to experiments. However, in you know, many cases, computation, our computational methods really focus on taking data as it is from other methods and trying to address their limitations or enhance them in different ways. And so I'm going to focus on the same trade-off between the spatial resolution and the genomic scale. And one particularly helpful approach has been to use algorithms to augment spatial measurements by using additional data sources, and in particular, by using single cell profiles. And so, Quite a number of years ago now, Rahul Satija, when he was a postdoc in my lab, he's now you know, a tenured professor in NYU, uh, together with Jeff Farrell, when he was a postdoc in Alex Shearer's lab, he now has his own lab at the NIH. This was a while back. They wanted to find a way to relate single cell profiles to space, in this case, in the context of uh, fish embryos, where they had spatial patterns that were measured in situ. These are all the in situ, in situ hybrids, you know, ice ages, one gene at a time and they had the single cell profiles. And so their idea was really clean and simple, like all good ideas. You start with an in situ pattern for a bunch of landmark genes, X, Y, and Z. Together, they would form our reference map. Now we would take a cell. It expresses, say, the red and the blue gene, but not the yellow. They would predict it comes from here. It expresses the yellow and the blue, but not the red. They would predict it comes from here. 
And you need to, to do some extra things, address noise and dropouts and matching the right, the different types, the nature of the um, data is different. So the distributions are different, but at the end of the day, they develop an algorithm for that called Sera. then got, you know, the name got reused much more broadly. And it handled the noise in our data and did the mapping probabilistically. And one of the nice utilities of this approach was that once we map the cells, we can use the mapping to infer spatial expression patterns of genes that were not actually in the in situ data. So if these are the mapped cells and there's some gene X that was expressed at some level at each cell, we can now infer an in situ pattern for the gene in each bin by weighing its expression in each mapped cell with the probability of mapping that cell to the bin. And this approach has since been uh, uh, developed substantially by different groups in different ways. And I should point out that when we published it, John Marioni published a very similar, uh, a similarly conceptual method, slightly different technically, uh, we did it back to back. And so this is kind of the beginning of the type of integration that one would need if you want to build an atlas. It's not just to improve the ability of the lab method, but we really want to relate across these different scales of biology. We have molecules and cells, and histology, and we actually also have anatomy of an entire organ. And so more recently, we decided to take a second stab at this problem in the context of mapping the brain as part of the brain initiative. And here, we're going to take a specimen for something like, say, single nucleus RNA-seq, but also obtain the immediate adjacent section for a histological stain. I'll show you in a little bit what this looks like. And now we would hope that we could use this, these two types of data, along with say spatial measurements of molecules as a fingerprint that would let us relate our cellular profiles to spatial transcriptomics data, but also to histological image and anatomical position in something known as the common coordinate framework of the brain. For the brain, you have that. In principle, that should exist for other organs as well. And so for this, we developed a new mapping method that we called Tangram, which was developed by Tommaso Biancalani, Gabriele Scalia, and other colleagues. And it solves a non-linear optimization problem here iteratively, as you would expect. So you initialize basically by randomly distributing the single cell or single nucleus profiles in your region of interest, known as the ROI. And then we have a score that I'll explain in a second to evaluate the mapping, which we call the tang by a tangram loss function. And then finally, we're going to optimize with stochastic gradient descent iteratively. So really, the key point of these methods is the loss function. So what does it consist of? So our function compares our cell mapping to the spatial data by considering three terms. The first is a density term. Uh, oops, sorry. There is a density term, a gene expression term, and um, a cell number term. And so the first I'll describe is actually the gene expression term. And so we compare the mapped expression to the spatially measured expression for any gene for which we have such a measurement, because some genes are only measured, um, only some genes are measured spatially. And we do it both for each gene across the voxel and for each voxel across all genes. We also assess the cellular density term, um, which we do by a kale uh, divergence metric uh, between the mapped single cell RNA-seq and the spatial data. And then the last piece is that we have this cell number term which is very important under particular conditions. And so imagine that our section, the image section has say a thousand segmented cells, but our single cell RNA-seq data might have 30,000 profiled cells or nuclei. And so we want to just select the best 1000 cells because that's all that piece of tissue actually allows us to have. And so for this, we have this filter F which is convolved actually in all the previous matrices that I showed. And so Tangram can be applied to combine single cell profiles with many different spatial modalities. So it can be data with low resolution, like in situ hybridizations, intermediate resolution, like spatial transcriptomics or Visium, and high resolution, like Murfish. And with the different methods, we get different benefits from, from using Tangram. So I'll start with Murfish. Here we're mapping the cells into the tissue. And um, you get this very high resolution view of which cell is where, because Murfish itself is a high resolution method. But now we can use this projection trick to get the expression of genes that were not in the shared features. So for example, here we withheld some of the Murphy's genes during the mapping, and we can compare our predictions to the experimental measurements and see that we did quite well. Now we can, of course, predict additional genes that were not in the 150 Murphy's genes. And here we confirm them by comparing them to the Allen Brain Atlas. Now, in some cases, we compare the Tangram prediction to the measured expression for Murphy's and they're in disagreement, 
But the Tangram prediction actually predicts, uh, conf agrees really well with the Allen Atlas. And the Murphy's measurements basically look like a lower quality signal that does you know, occur sometimes in experimental techniques. And so this suggests that we can actually correct measured expression. It's less critical in a method like Murphy's, which is very sensitive, but it becomes very useful when we move to methods like star map, star map which are amazing, but they are amazing at being able to measure, say, a thousand genes, and they pay some price for it in the quality for some of those genes. And so here, the Tangram predictions um, really help us correct the raw measurements from star map and obtain the expected layered patterns for several key genes. Now, the Tangram mapping can also be used to transfer other data to spatial coordinates when we don't have any spatial measurements for them if we have multi-omics measurements at the single cell level. So here, for example, we use ShareSeq, which is a joint single cell and uh, single cell RNA in a taxic method that we developed together with uh, Saima and Jason, Bur uh, with uh, joint postdoc with uh, Jason Bruan Rostro's lab. Sorry, Jason. And um, we don't yet have, to have a spatial method for chromatin accessibility, although some groups work on that. But we can use the mapping to project the chromatin accessibility through the cells that we profiled. Um, uh, that we mapped by the RNA signal. So RNA signal we have spatially and in single cells. And once we do this mapping, the cells transport or transfer with them the chromatin data, which now becomes spatialized. And then we can compare the localization of accessible chromatin to RNA expression. We can also then do things like inferring transcription factor activity, which often actually has these beautiful localized patterns, even if the RNA of the transcription factor itself is not localized. And we're still um, assessing the patterns of these targets. So now, can we also use this framework to tie to other levels of organization and knowledge like histology and anatomy? And this is especially appealing in the brain because there is a lot of existing knowledge in atlases like the Allen Brain Atlas and the Big Blue Atlas. And um, they include many different types of features. And all of these features are tied together through histology and anatomy in what I, I told you is called the Common Coordinate Framework or the CCF. So long term, we'd like to be able to see if we can just learn this CCF directly. But for now, all we did is use the knowledge that's already there. And so I promised to show you what these sections actually look like. And this is what makes it so relevant to us. And so when we planned the ANCLAS collection with Chuck Vanderberg in Evan McCosco's lab, we made sure that when Chuck obtains nuclei for profiling, he dissects and freezes the region. And then he takes a biopsy punch from the frozen dissected ROI for nuclei extraction and profiling. But he also sections and he stains the sections, which are actually those missing pieces that you don't see. He stains those missing pieces right above and right below, and as, as well as the area that actually has a hole in it um, to do histology. So now we can take these histological images, which have no molecular information in them directly, and we'll want to place them into the existing atlas. And so for this, we learned a model of anatomical depth from the existing brain atlas. And we saw, and, and that's the model on the left, and we saw that the point distance in the latent learned space actually represented the anatomical distance between the slices. It basically became one dimensional in the axis in which the, uh, uh, the slices are coming. And so this trained models allow, model allows us to really easily automatically retrieve an image from the Allen CCF onto which we can register our histological image. So I give you a section, you get the, the image from the atlas. Now, we also learned a model of the anatomical labels. Again, we use the Allen Atlas, so that now if we're given a new section, we can actually call the different anatomical regions on it with semantic segmentation, something that people do a lot. The trick for us was really to combine these two models into what would be a fully automated pipeline, despite all the imperfections um, and, the, and all the imperfections in the scanning in the data. And the trick that we used was to actually register masks rather than uh, histological images in the atlas directly. So for our section, we're gonna do anatomical region calling to make a mask. And then for the atlas section, we're gonna extract that mask and then we're gonna register masks to each other and apply this registration based to, back to the sections. And the benefit of this is that we now can actually bring everything together into one atlas. We give Tangram our sections and single nucleus RNA-seq profiles and we get back the anatomical regions, the cellular densities, the expression profiles of cells in each of these regions. We get all of it combined together. It also, on you know, 
occurred to us that it means that if we have a spatial method that has both molecular and histological data measured simultaneously, and this is the case for spatial transcriptomics or visium, then we can benefit from this additional knowledge in the original mapping task that we did, because we can leverage the known anterior to posterior coordinate from Tangram and only map single nucleus RNA-seq profiles that were collected from punches at that particular depth. And so we leverage this together with the fact that Tangram can constrain the mapping by the observed number of cells, as I showed you. And in this way, we can deconvolute Visium, which is not actually a single cell method. So for this, we combine the probability map with cell segmentation. Then we take each of the Visium circles that you see there, one at a time, and we ask, what are the most probable cells? And this is kind of cool in terms of actually telling you these colors, but you do have to remember that the assignment within the circle itself is actually random and that there is no one unique deconvolution. There are several solutions that seem to be compatible with the probability maps, although they in practice actually are really similar to each other. And so to conclude this second part, I showed you Tangram, which is a method that aligns uh, single nucleus RNA-seq data to various spatial modalities. And it gives a single cell mapping, genome-wide transcript projection, multimodal mapping with multiomics data, and uh, deconvolution. And with this additional automated registration pipeline, it lets us connect the molecules and the cells to histology and anatomy and any additional information that is out there about this histology, uh, histological and anatomically mapped section, which is a very rich set of information that neuroscientists have worked very hard um, to build. And that what gives us really a fully integrated Atlas. And so for the very last part of my talk, I want to turn from these uh, methodological questions and focus more on the ways in which we think that they can help us understand tissues conceptually, such as the roles of cells in tissues and histological modules and functional cellular circuits. And what I'm going to show you today is just a glimpse. Uh, but for us, it's really the main goal of, of all of these efforts. We first had to get some, you know, decent methodologies right, but at the end of the day, what kinds of biological questions would we want to ask as we move gradually, you know, from structure to function? And so the first and very brief illustrative example I want to give is, is on, goes back to the question actually of the cell's identity. So in particular, what might happen if we define cells not just by their intrinsic features, those could be their molecular profiles or their cellular morphology, but also by their extrinsic features. For example, the cells that neighbor them or the histological structure that they reside inside. And so to learn this kind of cellular definition, we de developed a model that we called in situ vec that basically just tries to look at the cell in two ways. On the one hand, it's going to look at the cell as an image, which is not just the cell itself, but the cell and its neighborhood within such distance. And then on the other hand, it's actually going to use the cell's own molecular profile as measured in situ. It's gonna encode each of them, and then it's going to sample these encodings. And then for the images, it will just decode, um, sorry, for the images, it will just decode um, the images back, but for the gene expression, it's going to build a joint embedding from both the image and the expression latent spaces, um, which, um, um, which um, from which it will try to reconstruct the, the expression level. And then, you know, from this in situ vec embedding, we can perform all sorts of operations like clustering and visualization. And when we do those, we basically end up taking into account both the expression in the cell and what is going on around it as is reflected by the image. Okay. So um, just one second. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Took me a moment to realize what was going on. And so we decided to apply to a data set that we previously collected with Peter Sorger's lab in an earlier study that measured 13 proteins in FFPE sections from 19 melanoma tumors. And just to orient you, um, here is one uh, section like this. In blue, we see the T cells uh, with CDA T cells in light blue. In uh, green um, are the malignant cancer cells that induce a program that we previously discovered from single cell RNA-seq that's called the T cell exclusion program. So they should promote a cold environment without T cells. And in red are malignant cells that repress the exclusion program so that they should promote a hot environment with T cells. And this is exactly what we see. Uh, there are red malignant cells that are interlaced with uh, blue, um, 
that are interlaced with blue teals, but the green cells make these big cold patches. And this is true across the patient samples, and you can quantify it and calculate the statistics, and you can show that this exclusion score is significantly higher in malignant cells that are in cold T cell depleted niches. So this is all published work. What we wanted to see is if we, if we can now understand these cells and their properties better by considering not just the expression of the 13 genes, but also how the cells relate to those around them. And so now we trained in C2VEC with fields of views, many fields of views from the nine patients, and we held all the data from three other patients as unseen. And to see if the model generalized, especially because these are tumors, we compared the predicted expression to the measured one uh, for each of the, of the three new tumors, and I'm showing you one of them, and generally it performed quite well. And so um, next, we used um, in, the in situ vec embedding in order to cluster the cells. And we included the three test samples. And you can see that they mix nicely with the embedding. And so now we can ask if we gain some new knowledge. So for example, for the CDAT cells, they form three clusters by in situ vec. And these three clusters actually make three distinct spatial patterns. One cluster has those T cells directly proximal to the MHC class one malignant cells. A second extreme is a cluster of T cells that make their way into the cold niche, even though quite sparsely. And we really can only see these patterns from the joint embedding. If we use only one source of features or the other source of features, we cannot make these distinctions. And then similarly for the malignant cells and the non-CDA T cells, they form these different groupings. So for example, the Treg cells um, are expressing exclusion genes only in the cold zone, and they're separating the malignant cells into four categories with different um, spatial and molecular patterns. And these patterns are persistent and they generalize across the patient samples, even those that were never seen by, even those you know, three patients that were never seen by the model. And so they can now suggest new categories of cells that we could not have distinguished based on the molecular intrinsic information alone. And those would require additional functional experiments to really understand what they do. But even in this example, we didn't actually look at the tissue. Still the unit that we, I, I was talking to you about was the cell, the cell, the cell, the cells got mapped here and the cells got mapped there and they had properties and they had categories. Can we actually go one level about that? And so for this, we're beginning to develop methods that relate the different cells to each other. And so from a tissue biology perspective, we actually expect cells to coordinate their function, either because they're all responding to the same signal or because the cells respond to a cue that if, you know one cell responds to the signal and it affects the other cells. And some of this could lead directly to the same response in you know diff same genes in different cells. But even if the cells actually respond differently, which is more likely, the response should be coordinated. And so this means that we expect a signal in our data that reflects this coordination. And I'm going to call this signal multicellular programs. Um, so if we want to relate multicellular programs and find this kind of signal, we need some way to relate the cells, the different types of cells to each other. So spatial proximity is one very obvious way to do this. And I'm going to show you that, but I'm also going to show you that you can even be looser than that, tissue locations or individuals or disease conditions. And so to look for these kinds of signals, Livna Jerby, who just finished her postdoc in my lab and started in Stanford Genetics, being a colleague of Anshul's, um, she developed a two-step approach that she calls dialogue. And so the first step, in, in the first step in dialogue, we apply a penalized matrix decomposition approach in order to identify sparse canonical variates that would transform the original feature space, say the genes, into a new feature space where these different cell type specific representations are actually correlated across different niches or different samples. And this really uses just the average signal in different cell subsets in each niche or sample. And then we have a second step where dialogue identifies the specific genes that comprise the latent features, and it does it by fitting multi-level models. I don't have a lot of time to elaborate on this, but this is also when we use the underlying single cell distributions. And so in our first applications, we focused on niches, uh, um, you know, spatial physical niches. And, and here a niche is basically a pair of directly proximal cells in MERFISH data in the hypothalamus. From an earlier study we did in uh, collaboration with Zhao Wang and Catherine Dulac's labs where they focused on per parenting behavior. And so Dialog found multiple cases of these pairwise multicellular programs. In each of these cases, it's a statistical association between the cells. Um, oh, sh now it's again disrupting me in the middle. Um, can you guys still see my slides? Hopefully. 
yeah, thanks. I don't know why my laptop keeps doing that today. Um, so these programs are related to different spatial distributions of the same cells. So for example, in the top are programs that couple excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And there's two different ones, MCP2 and MCP4. These are genes that are coordinated between their expression in excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. There's one particular pattern like that when they're organized like they are in the MCP, NCP2 example, and a different pair of programs are coordinated when they're organized like the MCP4, MCP4 example. And uh, below you see the same for astrocytes and inhibitory neurons. Then we took it one step further and we basically decided to make the Murphish data less good by what we call coursing it up. We dissociated it to these little regions that were about 50 to 100 microns squared in the image. That means about 500 cell aggregates. And then we learned the same MCPs with the same model, but we no longer had the immediate proximity. We just knew these 500 cells go together. Those 500 cells go together. And then we use the MCPs and the expression of a given cell in the test data to predict the expression of its neighbors in this radius of between 15 to 500 cells. And we saw that actually we can make really good predictions like these from data that was essentially dissociated. And so we thought, well, in that case, we can just try it out with tissue that was dissociated to begin with and look for cell-cell relationships there. And to test this idea, we used an atlas that we recently published last year for healthy and ulcerative colitis colon. It spanned 12 healthy individuals and 18 individuals that had ulcerative colitis. And overall, and that's why we chose it, it had 115 spatially distinct samples, each of them profiled by single cell RNA-seq. So we chose on five well-represented cell subsets, macrophages, two types of epithelial cells called TA1 and TA2, and two types of, of, of T cells, CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells, and looked actually beyond pairwise combination. And so first we wanted to see that the MCP really captures something real about the samples. So we did another little exercise. We trained the model after we contaminated the data. We took about 50 cells, 10 per type, from an adjacent sample from the same donor. So it could be a different layer or a different clinical condition. And then we used the MCPs from the trained model to predict each cell state. And we compared it to the real state of the cell, what we actually measured for it. And we call this difference the environment score. And so using these, we could predict which cells were actually misplaced with really high accuracy based on having basically a lower environment score, we predicted them worse. And so this did vary, depends on how we contaminate. We did best when the location differed, say lamina propria versus epithelial layer. And we did the best at finding misplaced T cells and the worst for macrophages. But we think that's kind of a cute idea on how to predict unusual infiltrators in tissue. But for now, all we got from it is kind of confidence that these kinds of approaches should actually give real biology. So I'm showing you just one biological vignette. These are the, this is from the MCPs themselves. So this multicellular program is made of different genes in each of the five different cell types. And they're labeled on the top, the, the cell types, the genes are in the rows. And it's, sorry, the genes are in the, in the columns, but their cell type association is labeled on top. And its induction across um, these cells is associated with ulcerative colitis. And it's enriched um, with multiple genes that are located in risk loci for IBD and ulcerative colitis. But these genes are expressed in different cells. They're just coordinated with each other across these cells, across the samples. And in fact, when we score this kind of program in bulk patient RNA-seq, it's actually predictive responses and anti-TNF therapy. And so to conclude this final part, I showed you two steps that we're taking to better understand cells in a tissue context and the function of tissues in situ vec, which helps define cells by both intrinsic and extrinsic features and dialogue that recovers multicellular programs, which can be applied both with spatial data and across cellular samples. And I'm going to conclude the talk with this. I just want to thank the people who did the work. I highlighted them throughout the talk, Brian Cleary for compressed sensing and SICE in collaboration with Faye Chen's lab, the work on DNA microscopy, which is really Joshua Weinstein's and um, he was a postdoc between my lab and Fung's lab. Um, the work on Tangram was led by Tommaso and Gabriele and was a nice collaboration with Evan Makosko and Zhao Wejuang um, on in situ vec by Ishit and uh, the work on dialogue by Livnak Jerby, who's now in Stanford with many people on this, uh, in this meeting. And I'll be happy to take any questions. I apologize for the many technical problems with my laptop, but they seem to have bothered mostly me. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Aviv. That was great. Um, so um, let's just jump to questions. Uh, there are a few questions trying to uh, pop up in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is from Omid Bazgir. He asks, I think that he's referring to your, um, the first part, the compression part of your talk. Uh, could you please clarify um, why you do SVD and then NMF? Um, no, we don't, we don't do SVD and then M and NMF. We compared three methods, SVD, sparse NMF, and SMAF. So it's one, two, three, but not first do one, then do two, then do three. So I guess the slide was a little confusing on this. So we compared these three and we show that SMAF performs better for decompression than these other two alternatives. That's all. And I didn't show the details for that. This is long published. Yeah. Sorry for the confusion. Thank you. Um, next question is from uh, Brody. Um, asks, thanks for the great talk. How critical do you find the architecture and hyperparameters of the autoencoder um, to performance? Did the decompression work using a cursory attempt or did it require a huge amount of experimenting and fine tuning? So, so I wouldn't say a huge amount of experimenting and fine tuning. I will, I will point out that maybe it was more painful to Brian than it was for me, but it didn't take a lot of time and a lot of fiddling. So I think that's a, still a very fair statement. I will say, and you can see it actually, we updated the bioarchive posting recently, so you can see kind of the latest version of this story. It's been out for a while posted. Um, I will say that there are cases when the autoencoder, when, when, when we prefer the segmentation free method and there are cases where we actually like the segmented method. So we had a hard time at the end of the day saying we obviously favor this over that or vice versa. I highlighted this one because it was unusual. And I thought that, that it's always good to notice the alternative possibilities. Um, but in the cases when it does or does not work well, it's really about the decompress as, as, as you decompress, there's, there's harder and easier things to solve. Some genes behave much better than others. Some of it is also the limited number of combinations that we had that requires all sorts of post hoc little um, solutions that get better and better the more combinations you have. So some of the performance of the different algorithms is more related to that than I think to the fundamentals of the problem. But generally I wouldn't say, uh, a very difficult one as Excellent. these kinds of fine tuning um, experiences go. Great. Um, maybe we can take, we have just time for maybe one more question. Uh, anyone from the panel? Yeah. Please. I have a question for, for Aviv, sorry. Thanks Aviv for the great talk. That's really fascinating work. Hey, um, I was wondering if you could maybe comment a little bit more on, especially given your new perspective in the, your new position of how the spatial and tissue information that you're learning could be used for uh, therapeutics and drug discovery? Like, what do you think are some of the most promising applications? Oh, I think there's many promising applications and some of them you will see faster than others usually for these domains, given, given where you are, for example, in a, in a making medicine drug discovery process, there could be things with huge impact, but if they're applied to the very early steps of the process, you're gonna see the payoff in 10 years from now. And if you're applying them to things that are done very late in the process, you're gonna feel the payoff faster, but it doesn't mean that the payoff is bigger. So the temporal and the, you know, the amplitude and the, and, the, and the extent of immediate gratification are often anti-correlated in that domain. It's not for people who need fast gratification, but the amplitude of the gratification is extremely high at the end. That's a little bit how I try to describe it to people. But so, so I'll try and describe from, from two perspectives. The first is things that actually happen relatively late. One of the challenges that you always have when you develop medicines is really understanding what is happening in the patient's body. So in a tumor, this would be particularly meaningful because you can obtain a lot of specimens from patients and you can look at them. And we're often limited in looking, especially in interpreting what we see based on knowledge that we already have. So so for example, imagine that you're using your, your favorite deep learning algorithm to do your most fantastic thing. At the end of the day, if you pose to people the thing seen, they still need to perform an act of interpretation in order to understand what has been going on. So if it's just for prediction purposes, it's one thing, but we usually need to understand why in biology. It's kind of not enough for us to just say this predicts that. We want to understand why and how. That's what makes biology a little different than other domains. And so for that, the ability to, 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 the ability to put together these different layers of biology 
into a single model is tremendously impactful because the molecular level tends to be a lot more interpretable for us, but the histological level carries a very um, substantial richness as I showed both on how the tissue actually functions, who is doing what to whom and how, but also um, the legacy knowledge of this is what we call this, and this is what we call that, and this is what we've seen here, and this is what we've seen there. So I think that is one domain that is active and is going to expand a lot and has a lot of impact. The other piece is when you're starting to think about how would you actually develop new medicine. In the end, disease happens in tissues. Through, there's impact, right? So, so think even on a, on a very genetic setting for a disease, say, uh, you know, a large impact single gene uh, kind of genetic disease. It impacts within a cell, which resides within a tissue. And a lot of what you see at the end is the tissue effect. If you think about a common complex disease like IBD or ulcerative, um, ulcerative colitis, which was in my very last example, actually the risk is distributed across many cells in the tissue and they're gonna impact each other. We don't understand that very well. And when we come with our intervention, it reflects our limited amount of understanding. And so the other place where I think we have a fantastic opportunity is to not just do interventions, both in models and by looking at the diversity of human specimens, basically both of these are interventions, either we do them or nature do them. Not to just do the intervention that we know would have an impact in the tissue, but to actually monitor their impact in these terms, rather than try to reduce everything just to the individual cell level and the individual genes inside the individual cell. And so things like screening in vitro, sorry, screening in vivo in this way, and using natural genetic variation or mutations in cancer, um, combined with uh, rich spatial information is going to have a dramatic impact on the types of, you know, on how we define targets and interventions for disease, which is what gives us medicines at the end. I, I would say these are probably the two, the two biggest ones. There's a lot of specific additional things, you know, toxicity and assessing toxicity is a very big one and is usually assessed at the tissue level and in other applications like that. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Aviv. Uh, so in the interest of time, I think- Thank you, we'll everyone. Move. It was a great talk. Um, so we'll start off with uh, the, um, the selected speakers now. Um, the first speaker is uh, Manu Saraswat, and he will be presenting a talk on convolutional additive models a fully interpretable approach to deep learning and genomics. Manu, if you're there, uh, can you start your video and share your screen? I actually do not see him in the panelists list. Let me see if he's in the attendees. Oh, I do, okay. <clears throat> Let me move him. Um, Manu, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, great. Can you see my slides? Yeah, can you start sharing your slides and also your screen? Yes. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Manu Saraswat. Uh, I'm currently a first year PhD student uh, with Oliver Stegley and Moritz Small uh, in Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, but today I will be talking about my work uh, in Vancouver titled Convolutional Additive Models, a Fully Interpretable Approach to Deep Learning in Genomics. Um, this was done uh, with uh, German Novakovsky, Etienne Munier, Uriel Fornes, and uh, supervised by Sara Mustafavi and Wyatt Wasserman. So deep learning methods have become pervasive in biology and healthcare, and they are being used in different domains, uh, such, as for, um, such as for analyzing electronic health records, an analysis of medical images, drug discovery, 
and understanding genomics. Uh, particularly for genomics, the deep learning models have been used at different levels of gene regulation, uh, starting from 3D organization of the genome to understanding DNA accessibility, DNA methylation, binding of transcription factors, and so on and so forth. The recent advances uh, in deep learning in genomics have, have been driven by convolutional neural networks. Now these methods take uh, a one-hot encoded DNA sequence as input and predict a functional output such as binding of transcription factor from say ChIP-seq data or chromatin accessibility from ADAC-seq data. Uh, the fundamental unit of such neural networks is a convolutional filter, which can be uh, thought of as a position weight matrix. Uh, matrix. Um, the model consists of multiple such uh, filters and the CNN learns non-linear combinations uh, of these filters together to make the prediction. Now these approaches uh, perform, outperform traditional methods based on KMR frequency and they do not require handcrafted features, but it's difficult to interpret these methods. It's, it's, it's useful to have some notion of interpretability in the deep learning model we, models we develop for two main reasons. First uh, is that if we understand how the model makes its predictions, we have more trust in the model, and then we can use those models in unknown settings. Uh, also, it will help us to debug the model uh, if it's learning something stupid. So over here, an example is shown where a model was developed to detect pneumonia from chest x-rays. And when the model was used uh, to predict, do these sort of predictions in images from a different hospital, it failed. And the reason was that the model basically learned the hospital token um, as one of the features. And when it was uh, used to predict on new hospital data, it failed. The second reason why we need interpretability in deep learning is if we are able to understand um, how the model is making its predictions, particularly in biology, it can leave, lead us to uh, novel insights. So an example here is shown from the DPNet paper where deep learning models and interpretability suite of DeepLift and DF Modisco uh, was used to decipher cooperativity between transcription factors and understand soft, motif, um, soft syntax of their binding. Now I'll briefly talk about the existing methods of interpretability in sequence-based deep learning. The first method is convolutional filter-based method. So, we represent uh, convolutional filters uh, as motifs of known transcription factor, uh, transcription factor, uh, transcription factors. Um, then, iteratively, we can nullify these filters and look at their impact on the model performance. And if it leads to a large change in prediction, it means that this filter is perhaps important for the model. And in this way, we can link the importance of a known transcription factor with, say, predicting accessibility in a particular cell type. However, there are several drawbacks associated with this method. Firstly, the filter representations we learn this way are dependent on architectural choices, particularly the length of filter, whether we have used, what is the size of max pooling we have used and the type of activation functions we are using. Also identifying uh, how different combinations of filter affect the prediction is time intensive because that would basically involve nullifying like combinations of two or three filters at a time. And thirdly, this method does not explain how the prediction has been made. The other method for interpretability is using feature importance scores. So once your model is trained, these methods give insights into which particular positions in an input sequence are important for making the prediction. So a simple way of doing it is using perturbation-based methods or in silico mutagenesis, where you would basically mutate each position in your input sequence and look at the prediction, whether it's changing or not, and accordingly decide whether a position is important. Or we could use backpropagation-based methods such as deep lift and grad cam um, to, to achieve the same task. Again, there are drawbacks associated with this method. Firstly, these methods might not uh, provide reliable scores, scores in all settings. And since we achieve these important scores at the level of individual input sequence, it's hard to quantify their global importance. And third, again, like the previous method, we, they do not explain how the prediction is actually made. 
Now, to overcome these drawbacks, we propose uh, our method called convolutional additive model, or CAM. Now, CAM consists of several independent units. Each of these units consists of a single convolutional filter followed by two fully connected layers. Now, since uh, we have, say, n of these units, and when we want to make a prediction for, say, binding of a transcription factor for XA1, we would just do the weighted sum of outputs from each of these individual units. Now, by just visualizing the final layer of our model, we get, we get insights into which units are important for each of these outputs. So over here, for example, if you want to look at which units are important for June D, we would just visualize this final layer and see that filter zero and filter eight, for example, are important for June D. And so the global uh, quantification of importance of these units becomes trivial just by visualizing. We don't have to do any nullification experiment here. Now, the idea for this model uh, was like inspired by the recent paper of neural additive models. What the authors in the paper did is, instead of using a usual feed forward neural network, which basically takes all the inputs, uh, then everything goes into everything. You have these fully connected layers. What the authors instead did was for each unit, they had a separate neural network. And the final prediction was basically a weighted sum of outputs from each of these different units. And the authors showed that on a bunch of uh, different tasks, both these models uh, perform the same, even though the NAM model, the neural additive model seems to ignore the nonlinear combinations between the inputs. So as a proof of concept, we used uh, the CAM model for prediction of transcription factor binding of three transcription factors, FOXA1, CTCF, and JUNDI, uh, based on ChIP-seq data. And we took a 200 base pair long uh, one hot encoded DNA sequence as input, and our CAM model had 10 independent units. And to ease the interpretability, we forced the final layer weights to be positive. Now, looking at the results on the left, uh, these are the precision recall curves and the rock curves. And uh, the AOCs of these curves are pretty decent and uh, they're comparable to what we got when we trained a multi-layer CNN with three convolutional layers, the values for which are shown in the brackets. Uh, but what we're interested more is in interpretability. So we visualize the weights of the final layer and also converted the filters into PWMs. And we found that, for example, in the case of June D, filter zero is important, and that filter in the model actually corresponds to the motif of June D. And similar observations were made for FOXA1 and CDCF. Now, one limitation of filter to BWM conversion uh, is that we might not get meaningful motif representations. So to overcome that, instead of converting filter to PWM, we used each individual CAM unit as an oracle and generated synthetic sequences which maximize the output. So the idea is that since we focus on this entire unit and not just the filter, those sequences which maximize the output from this unit can uh, lead in insights into what this unit is actually learning. So uh, for our experiments, we use genetic algorithms uh, to generate sequences which maximize the output. In the previous example of TF binding prediction, we saw that filter one um, is actually important for CTCF binding, uh, but it does not. The, uh, but it's it, uh, it does not correspond to any meaningful uh, motif representation. So we use genetic algorithms to uh, uh, make synthetic sequences, which uh, uh, maximize the output, and we found that those sequences consist uh, contained motifs of C2H2 zinc finger proteins. Um, and it makes sense that why this particular unit could be useful for uh, prediction of CDCF. Then to test the capabilities uh, of accuracy prediction and interpretability of our models, uh, of our CAM approach, uh, we resorted to a more complex task of predicting chromatin accessibility in mouse immune cell types. So uh, we use ATAC-seq data from 81 different mouse immune and stem cell types. 
we took the open chromatin regions from this data set, uh, took the one hot encoded DNA sequence of each of these open chromatin regions, and predicted their chromatin accessibility in all the all the all, all the immune and stem cell types. And highlighted in yellow is the B cell uh, lineage, uh, which uh, we'll discuss in detail. And we used a CAM with 300 units to make this prediction. And um, the, the performance of the model was measured as a correlation between the predicted and actual accessibility. And as a comparison, we used the AI TAC model, uh, which was recently published and was a deep learning based analysis of this data set. So looking at the results, uh, the average correlation of the test set is very close to what uh, was achieved using AI TAC. Then we converted the filters of each of these individual CAM units uh, to see what they are learning. And several of them correspond to known regulators of immune cell differentiation, such as PAX5, EVF1, and f kappa beta. Now, the most interesting part is that we wanted to see that whether we can assign these transcription factors to their particular importance in certain cell types. And for doing that, we just visualize the final layer of our CAM model. And uh, this is what we see. Now, the rows here represent the different cell types and the columns are um, the CAM units. And each, each, each value is the weight, particular weight for that particular cell type and the, the unit. And focusing here on the B cell lineage, we see that there is a group of units which is particularly important for uh, B cell uh, chromatin accessibility prediction. And looking detail into detail, we see that this actually PAX5 and EBF1 uh, motifs. And we get similar clus cluster over here for myeloid cells and a cluster for stem cells as well. Now, if we, if we were to generate this heat map using uh, traditional methods of uh, nullifying filter, we would have to take each filter, nullify it, like for each of the 81 cell types, and then get this one entry. So it will be much more time intensive, whereas with our method, it's just trivial to visualize the final layer. And this particular uh, group of transcription factors important for stem cells was actually not recognized by the AI DAC model. Uh, this is something we recovered with our method. So, in short, we make the interpretability very easy and uh, the performance of our method is also comparable to uh, the multi-layer convolutional methods. So now the question is that on the face of it, CAMs ignore the higher level interaction between filters um, because they are independent and yet they achieve similar level of performance as multi-layer CNNs. So what is happening there? Like, um, so the only difference between the CAM approach and our approach uh, and uh, PWMs is the, the use of fully connected layers. And we know that PWM methods do not perform really well. So we wanted to interrogate the role of fully connected layers. And to do that, we use the method employed in the BPNet paper. So we focused on one single CAM unit. We generated importance scores from DeepLift. Then we uh, clustered those secrets and generated a consensus motif for each of these CAM units. And then we inserted these consensus motifs into random sequences and moved them along the sequence to see if there's a positional importance learned by these fully connected layers. Um, and we see that there is some positional information learned because if the motif is present in the center of the sequence, uh, there is an increase in uh, the model, uh, model prediction, whereas on the sides, uh, there isn't a lot of change. Now we compared it to a model where we remove all the fully connected layers and just use simple max pooling. So for each of these filters, we have just one output, which is basically the maximum activation of this filter in the sequence. And uh, when we repeated the exercise, and obviously, since there is no positional information here, we get the same level of activation at all positions. But to our surprise, the model still performs as good as the one with fully connected layers, like similar uh, average correlation on test set and same level of interpretability, which is surprising because we have lost all positional information and all higher, higher level interactions. So the question is, do we really need positional information and higher order interactions for modeling regulatory activity of TFs? And 
why do deep learning methods perform better than BWM approaches? Um, is it because they learn better motif representations? Are they learning new motifs? Or is it just that the level of the data modality resolutions we have right now are uh, the, the simple methods are just enough to model them? And um, with this, I'll conclude my talk. So the three conclusions, CAMs achieve global interpretability through final layer weights visualization without compromising on accuracy. Using synthetic sequences, CAM overcome the limitations of filter to PWM conversion. And CAMs recover regulatory landscape of mouse immune cell differentiation without time intensive interpretation techniques. Um, thank you. And I would be happy to take questions, uh, comments, or suggestions. Great job, Manu. Fantastic talk. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly go through questions. We've got quite a few. Um, so the first question is from Ben Zhao. Uh, is the CAM strategy limited to a single convolutional layer? Have you tried extending it to two or more convolutions for each additive neural network to capture higher level filter-filter interactions? Of course, at the expense of runtime and some interpretability. Um, we actually like, the thing is like just with using single filter, we were able to achieve what multi-layer CNNs do. So we didn't feel the need to try that approach. Um, and uh, as as you said already, that if we use multiple filters, that will be that will come at the expense of uh, losing some interpretability. So we didn't do it. But what we did try is like compared like compare a single uh, convolution layer approach. And uh, it's interesting that a single convolution layer approach does not work, but the CAM approach does work, which has like independent units like single filters. So yeah. Excellent. Um, next question is from um, uh, Alex Liu. Great talk. Does this kind of architecture only work for losses that use a single score, or do you think they can be adapted to autoencoders or generative self-supervised um, outputs? Um, in, 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 I think they should work for other architectures as well. I don't see why that would be a limiting uh, case for it. Um, the only thing we are doing is like, instead of learning like higher order interactions, we are just like separating them into and making a very additive, simple version of it. So I think they would work for those cases as well. Great, great. Uh, Sean Moni asks, uh, if the fully connected layers are not adding anything to the performance, then does CAM outperform a linear combination of PWM based methods or um, an SVM, for example? Yes, uh, thanks for asking this, Sean. And we actually tried this and I have a slide to show what happens. So this is the correlation on test set we get with PWM based approach. So this is slightly less than uh, what we get with the usual model. And uh, on the right is the interpretability, uh, the matrix, it's not very clear. So we do, we do get some information, but uh, it's not as good as a full CAM model. But uh, like it's it's an interesting exercise to see that because uh, we the fully connected layers don't really add anything. We see that. So I actually looked at the literature and found a few papers uh, which used PWMs with dynamical dive frequency, and uh, and feed it into a logistic regression, which is basically what our final layer is doing. And uh, this approach basically outperformed the deep sea based architecture. So what I haven't tried is PWN so dynamic frequency, and maybe that performs as good as the multi-layer CNN or the CAM. So that is something I would want to try and see. Excellent. Um, let's see, there's lots of questions coming up. Um, do your results suggest that there are no, uh, no or very few spatial relationships between different motifs in regulated regions? That is a question uh, which I left as an open open question to all the uh, all the audience as well, because on the face of it, it looks like that indeed, uh, without including any spatial uh, interaction, we are still able to achieve uh, what you would get with something which includes those interactions. So. Yeah, our model. Exactly, our model exactly suggests, yeah. That's. Um, thanks so much. There are a ton more questions uh, in the Q&A. So it will be great if you can go in there and, and just answer them. Um, OK, sure. I would do that. And um, thanks, everyone, uh, for, for listening and for the questions. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'll, sh uh, I'll, I'll shift this over to now uh, Sarah, who will um, host the next talks. OK. Hi, everyone. This is Sarah, um, the other one of the five co-organizers. 
So we're going to move on to the next talk by Avanti Sri Kumar from um, Anshul's lab. And she's going to talk about benchmarking reverse, reverse complement strategies for deep learning models and genomics. Hi, thank you. Yeah, can, every, can you hear me and see my slides and everything? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, great. Uh, well, hi, uh, I'm Avanti and I'm excited to talk to you about our work on benchmarking reverse complement strategies for deep learning models in genomics. Uh, this is joint work with my mentee, Hannah, who's a very talented high school senior in case anybody's like on college application panel, she's excellent. And my, my PhD advisor, Anshul. Um, okay, great. So in this work, we're concerned with models that predict signals of regulatory activity given DNA sequences input. Our labels come from experiments that measure genome-wide regulatory activity. Um, for example, a ChIP-seq experiment produces a signal that indicates the binding strength of a particular transcription factor at each region in the genome. The inputs to our models are DNA sequences and the outputs predict uh, the experimental signal measured at those input sequences. And there's many types of output prediction tasks. So in this work, we'll be concerned with binary models, which predict the presence or absence of a signal peak over the input sequence, and profile prediction models, which uh, were mentioned in the earlier talk, uh, and they predict the shape of the signal along the input sequence. Uh, and our models will be convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, which, as you saw, tend to give state-of-the-art results when applied to these types of prediction tasks. Okay. Um, so here's a depiction of a CNN architecture. Yeah. Sorry, um, is there some echo or some issue? No, no, go ahead. Just okay. mute it. Somebody else. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so here's a depiction of a CNN architecture. Uh, the input to the model is the DNA sequence represented as ones and zeros, and the layers in the CNN learn patterns called motifs that transcription factors like to bind to. For example, the sequence shown here contains a match to the GADA motif. And because double-stranded DNA has complementary base pairing, we should expect that the model will give a similar output even if the reverse complement sequence is supplied as an input. Unfortunately, standard CNN architectures are not guaranteed to learn the symmetry. So although the model may have learned to detect the GATA motif in the forward orientation, it may not recognize the motif when it appears in the reverse complement orientation. And the difference between strands can be quite large even when the training data set is augmented with reverse complement sequences as shown in the scatter plot, scatter plot from a previous paper. So two strategies have emerged in the literature to guarantee reverse complement symmetry. Uh, prior to this work, these strategies had only been proposed for binary or regression prediction models. That is, they hadn't been extended to profile prediction models. So I'll first describe how they work for binary models and then talk about how we extend them to profile prediction models. The first strategy it, uh, feeds both the forward and reverse complement versions of the input sequence through the same model, and it combines the predictions to form the output. So these are called conjoined or Siamese architectures. And note that the merging of the output across the forward and reverse complement strands can be performed either during model training or after the model has been trained, which we call a post hoc conjoined model. And so far, post hoc conjoined models have not been benchmarked systematically against trained conjoined models. And the main drawback of conjoined models is that the convolutional layers must learn the forward and reverse complement versions of each motif as though they're two completely separate motifs. So to address this, another strategy that has been proposed is reverse complement parameter sharing or RCPS. And this strategy was first proposed in 2017 and it has been applied and extended in multiple published papers. So to understand how RCPS works, we will first make an observation about how we take the reverse complement of a one hot encoded sequence. And we'll assume we've done the one hot encoding using the ordering ACGT in the channel dimension. So in this case, taking the reverse complement involves flipping the one hot encoding along the length dimension, which corresponds to the reverse in reverse complement, and also exchanging the paired bases, uh, that is exchanging A with T and uh, that, yeah, sorry, exchanging the paired bases, uh, that is exchanging A with T and G with C, which corresponds to taking the complement in reverse complement. And note that when the ordering is ACGT, this is equivalent to flipping the sequence along the channel dimension. Um, so in RCPS, this idea of complementary pairing is extended to the convolutional layers. 
specifically, each convolutional filter's weights are paired with those of a new RC filter in such a way that the RC filter recognizes the reverse complement of whatever pattern its partner filter recognizes. And as a result of this pairing, if we were to flip the layer activations along the length and channel dimensions, we would get what the layer activations would be on the reverse complement input. And so we achieve what's called equivariance in the convolutional filter activations. Specifically, if we define the RevComp operation to mean flipping of both the length and the channel dimensions, then taking the RevComp of the layer activations is equivalent to computing the layer activations on the RevComp of the input. And if you find it easier, you can also think of the RevComp operation as a rotation by 180 degrees, which is equivalent to flipping the input along both the dimensions. Um, the pairing of the forward and reverse complement filters exists not just in the first convolutional layer, but also in the higher convolutional layers. And as a result, the equivariance property is maintained on higher convolutional layers. And finally, in order to make a prediction that combines the information from both strands, the forward and reverse complement channels are merged prior to being supplied to the fully connected layers. So as mentioned, neither conjoined nor RCPS architectures have been extended to base pair resolution signal profile prediction models. And what's more, RCPS models have not been systematically benchmarked against conjoined models. And even among conjoined models, it's unclear whether models that are conjoined during training outperform models that are converted to conjoined models after training. So in this work, we address these three limitations. Uh, let's begin by discussing how we extend reverse complement strategies to base pair resolution signal profile prediction models, or the so-called BPNet models proposed in uh, AFSEC et al., which is, was mentioned in the previous talk. Um, these models learn to predict the shapes of TF footprints at base pair resolution given DNA sequences input, and they can do an extremely good job. Uh, so here are some example observed profiles for OCT4 and SOX2 chip nexus data, and here are the corresponding predictive profiles. And these profile predictions are so good that for some tasks, they are closer to the original single than even biological replicates. And the model can also learn many subtle features of the regulatory code that are missed when you use standard binary or regression models. So let's delve into the architecture of a standard BPNet model. The goal of these models is to predict for each strand what fraction of the reads in the output window were observed at each base. VPNet architectures are still convolutional neural nets with some subtleties such as dilated convolutions for larger receptive fields and skip connections to increase the depth. And the main difference in these architectures is the output layer, which is a convolutional layer that has two channels, one per strand, and a length equal to the length of the, to the size of the window that we want to predict the output over. A softmax nonlinearity is applied to each convolutional channel to get the final predicted probability distribution for each strand. And this predicted probability distribution is then evaluated using a multinomial loss function. And in order to account for sequence specific biases in the assay, a controlled signal track may be concatenated as an extra channel at some intermediate convolutional layer and supplied as an input to the later layers. So let's talk about how we can make a conjoined version of the BPNet architecture. As before, we start by applying the model to the original input sequence. However, we'll stop short of applying the softmax operation just yet, so the outputs will represent the logits of the softmax for the positive and negative strand. And as before, we then reverse, com uh, we then reverse complement the input sequence and supply it in parallel to the same model. And the control signal track is concatenated as an extra channel of an intermediate convolutional layer and would also have to be reverse complemented to match the orientation of the input sequence. In our models, the control signal track is not stranded, so reverse complementing it is the same as reversing it. And I've added some toy values to make that clearer. After the control track is concatenated, we can continue with the model until we get the predicted logits. And here we have to note a subtlety. The predicted logits for the positive strand, given the reverse complement inputs, actually corresponds to the predicted logits for the negative strand, given the original inputs while the predicted logits for the negative strand, given the reverse complement inputs, correspond to the predicted logits for the positive strand, given the original inputs. And so to get our predictions on the reverse complement to match our predictions for the original input, we need to again apply a reverse complement operation to get the predictions, uh, sorry, we need to apply a reverse complement operation to the predictions, which as before consists of flipping them along both the length and the channel axes. And then uh, once the predictions line up, we can safely add the predicted logits together and then apply our softmax operation to get our output. 
So what about RCPS PPNet? Um, as before, each convolutional filter is paired with an RC filter that recognizes the reverse complement of its partner. And this property gives rise to the reverse complement equivariance that we discussed earlier. But what about the input control signal track, which is concatenated as an extra convolutional channel? Well, in order to maintain the, the reverse complement equivariance, this track is simply paired with its reverse complement, which is concatenated to the other end of the convolutional filter stack. Finally, instead of having two completely separate output channels for each strand, uh, the weights of the two channels are paired using the reverse complement weight sharing. And as before, a softmax is applied to each strand in order to get the final signal profile shape predictions. This setup maintains the reverse complement equivariance property throughout the network. Uh, so now we come to the crux of the paper, which is the benchmarking. We use two types of data sets, binary and profile prediction data sets. Our binary data sets are similar to the ones used in our original RCPS paper from 2017. We had three TF chipseq data sets from ENCODE where the positive set consisted of one kilobase regions around high confidence chipseq peaks and the negative set consisted of accessible regions that didn't have high chipseq signal. And we also had two simulated TF binding data sets that differed in the length of the sequences. That is, they were 200 base pairs and one kilobase pairs respectively. Uh, and which contained motif instances that were sampled from three different PWMs. Uh, for base by resolution signal profile prediction, we used the chip, chip nexus data from the BPNet paper by AFSEC et al, which contained uh, four TF data sets. And the base by resolution signal was predicted for one kilobase pair region surrounding the chip nexus signal peaks. And this gives a total of nine data sets. And for each architecture and data set, we trained models with 10 different random seeds and early stopping to assess performance. So one of the key takeaways of our benchmarking was that post hoc conjoined models outperform models that were conjoined during training. Uh, as a reminder, post hoc conjoined means that the model is trained normally and the predictions on the forward and RC strands are combined at test time. And note that the training data set is augmented with reverse complement examples. By contrast, conjoined during training means that the predictions on the forward and reverse complement strands are combined while the model is being trained. And as you can see, the purple bars are consistently comparable to or higher than the red bars across all nine data sets. And the other three bars are green for RCPS, orange for standard model, models trained with reverse complement data augmentation, and blue for standard models trained without reverse complement data augmentation. Um, and just as a point of clarification, there's no need to do reverse, or it's redundant to do reverse complement data augmentation for RCPS and Siamese architectures because that is mathematically equivalent to just duplicating your input examples because they already see the information from, implicitly see the information from both strands. Okay. So here's an, a mathematical intuition for why post hoc conjoined models tend to do better than models that are conjoined during training. Um, imagine a standard model that we do know with M that is in the process of being trained and Let's say M over predicts on a sequence S while under predicting on its reverse complement. If the training data set is augmented with reverse complements, then S and its reverse complement, complement appear as separate examples in the data set. And the gradient update during training would try to lower the prediction on S while raising the prediction on its reverse complement. Uh, now consider the case where M is conjoined during training. Here, the predictions on the forward and reverse complement are combined, for example, by averaging. And thus the prediction might be close to the true value and may not be updated during training, even though the model's predictions are incorrect for each strand. For example, you know, as to get a sense of why they may be incorrect, what may be happening is perhaps the model is missing a motif on the reverse complement strand and it's canceling out that with some artifactual signal that it's recognizing on the forward strand. And as a result, if you have models that are conjoined during training, they're less likely to converge to the most generalizable solution compared to models that are simply conjoined, converted to conjoined models after training. In the latter case, it's more like ensemble in your predictions. So another finding from our benchmarking was that the performance of RCPS is inconsistent across data sets. Although RCPS models sometimes achieve the best performance, there are other tasks where RCPS does, uh, it's, sometimes it's the best performance, but there are other tasks where it sometimes does quite poorly compared to the other models, um, particularly in the case of base pair resolution signal profile prediction. And this poor performance of RCPS is a bit unexpected because as we prove in our paper, the RCPS architectures can represent any solution learned by the conjoined models. 
and thus if the RCTS models are failing to outperform the conjoin models, it's because they've converged to a less than ideal solution. So I'll give a sketch of how the proof works. As a reminder, uh, the, in the conjoin models, the model is run in parallel on both the forward strand and the reverse complement strand, and the model predictions are combined to produce the output. Uh, so we're going to illustrate how the layer activations of the conjoin model can map onto the layer activations of an equivalent RCTS model. What happens is that the activations of the conjoin model on the forward strand become the forward filter activations in the RCTS model, while the activations of the conjoin model on the reverse strand or reverse complement strand become the RC filter activations in the RCTS model after applying a reverse complement operation. And finally, the act of combining the predictions across the strands in the conjoin model maps onto the step where the forward and RC channels are combined in the RCTS model to give the final output. So to summarize, in this work, we extend RC architectures to signal profile prediction and performed systematic benchmarks. We found that post hoc conjoin models consistently did as well or better than trained conjoin models and present a mathematical intuition for why. We also found that the performance of RCBS was inconsistent across data sets. So although it sometimes performs the best, it also sometimes does poorly relative to other architectures. And this happens in spite of the fact that the RCBS architectures are capable of representing the solution learned by the conjoin models, which means that the RCBS models are not converging to the ideal solution. And so we recommend that users who are interested in RC symmetry should actually default to post hoc conjoin models before exploring RCBS. Yep, that's uh, all I have, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Avanti, for a great talk. You have a number of questions. We'll see how far we can get. Um, so starting from Lai Shen, why not use conjoined and both training and post hoc? Um, so they're, they're kind of in, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding the, the question because they're kind of in opposition, like, sorry, okay, maybe, okay. If the model is conjoined during training, we also retain that conjoined property when the model is deployed. Um, so the models that are conjoined during training are also, they're also retain that conjoined aspect when they're deployed. Uh, it's not that we take it away when we deploy it. Um, so it's, it's it, the only difference is whether the, the model was also conjoined while it was being trained. Cool. Um, okay, so next question. My understanding is that some TFs are strand specific and they're binding and activity while others aren't. How prevalent do you see your sym uh, symmetry architecture in the wake of existing and strand specific specificity for a subset of TFs? Um, so, uh, so my understanding when, when you say strand specific, uh, DNA is inherently double stranded. So uh, maybe the, the TF is like binding in a particular orientation, but when it comes to like recognizing the motif, um, like the signal that we get from, from ChIP-seq, it's just saying like, you know, that you have a TF binding in this area and the motifs that we pick up, the motifs are just saying like, this is a motif from like the ChIP-seq signal. It's, it's not telling you about the biophysics of how the TF is binding. That motif, we should be recognizing it, whether the motif occurs in the forward or the reverse strand because the DNA is inherently double-stranded. Um, and of course, like if you have something that's binding to single strand like RNA, of course you would not want to use this reverse complement symmetry, but the DNA is inherently double-stranded, so we should rec recognize the motif whichever strand it occurs on. Um, I, ho I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, so uh, one more from Jacob. Thanks for the great talk. In case of conjoined models for binary predictions, you can sum average the forward and reverse complement representations before passing them to the fully connected layer. Have you compared post hoc conjoined models with multiple fully connected layers to analogs conjoined during training? Do you think representation merging before the fully connected layer could impact the perform performance in those cases? Um, so in the conjoined models, uh, so in the, in the architectures we happen to train here, uh, we didn't have multiple intervening fully connected layers, but more generally in the way that conjoined models are described in the paper, that merging um, is actually done a, a, to the logit of the sigmoid. So if you had multiple fully connected layers, that merging would be done you know, towards the end. Um, and if you wanted to like do the proof for like how that would map onto an equivalent RCPS architecture, uh, then you would, you would basically have the equivalent of like RC fully connected units, which you know, that's, it's a trivial extension of the way you would do it for convolutional units. 
So um, I, I may have like missed the nuance of the of the question. Uh, so it, it it could certainly matter where you do the merging of the strands if there is like okay. So yeah, uh, uh, when it uh, okay maybe this is the the question. But when it comes to like when you should merge the two strands uh, for most regulatory uh, genomics like applications and signals. Um, the sequence that we provide is not oriented in any particular way. So we expect that, you know, if if there if we like if the output is strong when a motif is located 10 base pairs left of the center, it should also be strong if the motif is located 10 base pairs to the right of the center, which means that any positional patterns we learn should be roughly um, symmetric. Uh, but if in an application where that's not the case, where uh, maybe you've like oriented it, uh, you're, you're dealing with promoters and you're always orienting your sequence such that the transcription start site is to the right, then in those applications, uh, it, it could certainly be a bad idea to do the merging of the Siamese architectures or the conjoined architectures prior to the fully connected layers because the fully connected layers may learn some asymmetric positional pattern. Um, so you, you could certainly do the merging later and that there's yeah, the, the this framework allows you to do the merging later, uh, you know, up until the uh, in, in the way that we've written the code and the merging is done at the logit, uh, just prior to being provided to the sigmoid. Um. Okay, thank you so much, Arwanti. Do, the questions are still in the QA, so you can go and check if you want to, because some of them were complicated. And there's a, a few other questions um, for you, so if you have time to answer those. Okay. Uh, thanks again so much. Um, so yep. we can go to the next talk. Okay. Um, that's by Dan Lee. Um, and he's going to talk about detecting higher order structural changes in 3D genome organization and multitask matrix factorization. Cool. Um, thank, oh, thank you. Can everyone hear me? And see uh, the slide and also see my mouse that I'm waving. In yes, the yes to all. <laughs> okay. Right, on, thank you. All right, we'll get started. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tain Lee and today I will present our multitask matrix factorization method to detect higher order structural changes in 3D genome organization. Um, so the human DNA, if you stretch it out linearly, would form a chain about uh, two meters in length. So this long molecule storing our genetic code is packed into a cell's nucleus whose diameter on average is six micrometers. So this level of compaction is equal to, uh, or is equivalent to folding a 24 mile long thread into a tennis ball. So in order to accomplish this feat of um, compaction, the DNA is tightly wound around histone proteins and various other proteins alternately fold, unfold, and bind to the DNA, uh, leading to a very specific control flow of our genetic code depending on the state and the function of the cell. And we refer to this systematic packaging of the DNA as 3D genome organization. And it has emerged as a key regulatory mechanism behind uh, cellular processes. So one way it can influence function is by bringing regu regulatory regions like enhancers and promoters together in 3D space, uh, triggering gene expression. HiC, which stands for High Throughput Chromosomal Conformation Capture Technology. Now this technology enables the study of 3D genome organization by measuring the tendency of genomic regions to interact. Um, it generates a symmetric, like this, a symmetric matrix like this, uh, whose entry represents how often the region corresponding to the row uh, interacts with the region corresponding to the column. So here we see as an example, the high C interaction uh, count matrix capturing the interaction between an enhancer and a promoter region, uh, which are pieces of DNA sequences uh, with a control function that can again trigger gene expression. So the analysis of HiC data has revealed that the genome is in fact organized into higher order structural units. Uh, for instance, like chromosomal territories where each chromosome uh, tends to localize in the nucleus and compartments uh, with a compartment uh, being the open accessible domains enriched in uh, transcriptionally active regions and B compartment uh, being kind of the coiled up repressed regions. And we also have local structures like topologically associating domains or TADs which are preferentially interacting neighboring regions. Now, TADs are enforced by architectural proteins like CTCF and the cohesin complex or the transcription uh, elongation activity by the RNA polymerase. 
Now, these organizational uh, principles and properties are conserved across many species, including uh, mammalian systems. And the dynamics of 3D genome organization is of particular interest. It has been shown that the deep 3D genome changes throughout the differentiation process, as well as during pluripotency reprogramming. And disruptions to 3D genome uh, across multiple structural scales can lead to cellular malfunction. Uh, for instance, large chromosomal rearrangements or structural variants deviating from the normal karyotype are hallmarks of many types of cancer. So here we see, for example, uh, Philadelphia translocation, which leads to the BCR-ABL gene fusion and is used as a kind of a diagnostic marker for chronic myelogenous leukemia. And here in a breast cancer cell line of T47D, uh, we have a high CD and a visualized uh, heat map here. We see the uh, disrupted chromosomal interaction pattern when it's compared to a normal, quote unquote normal, a uh, human memory epithelial cell at the bottom. Even at finer local scales, uh, structural disruptions can cause havoc. So here we see how an inversion, sequence inversion around the existing TAD boundary uh, brings a previously insulated uh, enhancer, which is this uh, tiny uh, orange oval here, right next to the WANT6 gene. And this triggers uh, some kind of a gene, regulata gene regulatory cascade program uh, leading to the F syndrome uh, syndactyly. So a key problem in regulatory genomics is to be to detect higher order structural changes in dynamic processes and across diverse contexts. And there are existing computational methods and, uh, and computational methods, excuse me, to detect changes in 3D genome organization. However, they are limited in one or more ways. Uh, we have some of them that only detect changes at individual interaction levels and miss out on kind of the higher level uh, structural unit level changes. There are uh, coarse comparison metrics available, but with those you cannot uh, pinpoint the regions of change that you can zoom into. Uh, some methods specialize only in a single structural unit or resolution like TADS, and finally, uh, most can only make pairwise comparisons between two data sets at a time. So we developed a method called TGIF uh, based on multitask matrix factorization to attempt to address these limitations. Now, non-negative matrix factorization, or NMF, is the core component of our proposed method. Uh, just as you can factor a number into two smaller numbers, you can factor a large matrix into two smaller matrices. Now, why might this be useful? The smaller factor matrices can be used to co-cluster the row entities uh, to the column entities. So for instance, if you had the Netflix challenge uh, data of uh, user movie ratings, you can find a group of movies, perhaps by genre, and groups of users who prefer those groups of movies. Formally, the goal of NMF is to find two lower dimensional uh, factors, U and V, that will approximate uh, the input matrix X when they're multiplied together. Now, uh, to, take it, to take advantage of the fact that in many domains, you have known relationship between the row or the column entities, you may wish to incorporate that information into the factorization process. Again, going back to that Netflix example, if you have information about the Netflix user social network activity, uh, the factorization process may benefit from knowing uh, people connected in the social network with similar interests and preferences. So in this constrained variant of NMF, we introduced this uh, graph regularization term to encourage the factor, in this case V, to be informed by or be smooth to the graph topology that's captured by the graph Laplacian matrix uh, L. Now we extended this to a multitask framework, uh, TGIF, so we can naturally compare multiple contexts. Uh, in our proposed multitask NMF method at TGIF, uh, each task corresponds to a biological condition or a cellular state and has its own input high C matrix. And then for each task T, uh, we want our goal is to find U and V factors that will approximate X uh, while being smooth to the task specific uh, graph topology. And in addition, uh, the factors from tasks that are closely related in the task tree or the task hierarchy will be constrained to be more similar to their shared parent factor here. And in order to learn these factors uh, to, that optimize this objective, uh, we use a hierarchical alternating least square optimization or HALS, a type of block coordinate descent with a guarantee to converge to a local minimum. Now, once you have those output factors, we can compare them in the same lower dimensional space since the first column or um, the latent feature from uh, factor U of task A corresponds to that of task B. So we can use these factors to cluster the genomic regions and then find regions whose cluster assignment has changed across tasks. 
Now, first, we apply TGIF to simulated data sets with known ground truth clusters. Uh, and to do this in the most general setting, we created uh, three different asymmetric matrices with three block diagonal structures representing the ground truth clusters. And the within uh, cluster signal was drawn from a normal distribution with a mean of five, and the background signal uh, was drawn from distribution with mean of one. And we experimented with increasing levels of random noise with negative values capped at zero. So here the input matrices are visualized uh, when the random noise variance level is six. Now we benchmark TGIF to other variants of multitask NMF. Uh, the first kind that we benchmark to uh, called joint NMF is just a simple NMF applied to a concatenation of the input matrices along the shared dimension uh, yielding a single factor V uh, for the shared column or feature space. Uh, Multi-view NMF is another one. It's a basically TGIF without graph regularization and with a single parent shared across all of the tasks. We also compare TGIF without any graph regularization using a two-level task tree seen here. And finally, for the full form of TGIF, uh, we used a simple neighborhood graph connecting regions that are basically within two, uh, uh, connecting entries within two indices of each other. So the adjacency matrix of these uh, task specific neighborhood graphs are visualized right here, sandwiched in between the factors in the input matrix. Now we measure the recovery of the ground truth clusters uh, with folks Mallow's index or FMI. Uh, FMI is a geometric mean of precision and recall. So the true positives used for calculation refers to the pairs of uh, data points, so pairs of rows or pairs of, pairs of columns in the same cluster, both in the ground truth and in the predicted clusterings from the NMF factors. And the false positives, FP, uh, refer to the number of pairs in the same cluster in the ground truth only, and the opposite for false negatives. Now, for each increasing level of random noise, uh, we ran each method with 100 times with different uh, random initializations and took the average FMI across the three tasks per learn and uh, three tasks per run, and then we plotted the mean. We also plotted the standard deviation, but the standard deviation is very small and thin, so it just kind of looks like a line here. <laughs> Now, as we increase the level of, level of random noise in the input data, we see that up to a relatively uh, high level of noise, so six here, multi-view NMF, which is the baby blue colored dotted line, uh, as, well as well as TGIF without graph regularization, so noted as tree here in the orange dotted line, they recover true uh, sample or row space cluster better than the simpler joint NMF, and so that's a solid blue line. At, at, at very large noise levels where kind of the foreground and the background signals start uh, merging. Joint NMF uh, outperforms them possibly due to the availability of larger amount of data in the concatenated input matrix. And as expected, adding graph regularization boosts performance, uh, at ex especially at very high uh, no noise levels. In the feature column space uh, clustering, similar pattern is shown, interestingly enough, um, graph regularization of the row space factor U so it's these guys here, helps with the true cluster recovery in the column space uh, using factor V. So it's these uh, clusters here. And as, as we see uh, in the TGIF, this line catching up to the joint NMF with at the very high levels of noise. Next, we apply TGIF to real high C data, which is what we care about. Uh, we started with real genome-wide high C matrices from karyotypically normal hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, or HSPC, and these are bone marrow cells with the potential to become any blood cells, any type of blood cells. And then we also have high C data sets from two chronic myelogenous leukemia cell lines, K562 and KVM7, and then the two leukemia cell lines shared a parent in the task tree. Now here we visualize uh, the sub-matrices of interactions only involving chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. Now each TGIF cluster is represented by uh, differently colored horizontal bars. So for instance, uh, this yellow bar here represents the TGIF cluster that is neatly subsuming all chromosome nine regions in HSPC and the blue bar uh, cluster corresponding to regions under chromosome 22. Now from the earlier slide, uh, you might recall that the Philadelphia translocation between chromosome nine and chromosome 22 is a hallmark of uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. And it's captured as kind of this increased interchromosomal interaction pattern pronounced in the KBM7 uh, high C data shown here. 
Now, TGIF detects a single fuse cluster among all regions from chromosome 9 and 22, represented by this blue bar in KBM7, kind of reflecting the large-scale translocation between those two chromosomes. We next apply TGIF to even higher resolution count matrices from mouse neural uh, development data with high-C data from uh, mouse embryonic stem cells, uh, MESC, and neural progenitor cells, NPC, and cortical neurons, CN. So here we visualize the interactions around the 85 megabase region of chromosome 18 and the TGIF clusters of those regions uh, represented in these colored bars again. And we see this fused cluster in the region around uh, the 85 megabase of chromosome 18 and cortical neurons highlight highlighted uh, by this pink horizontal bar here. So we see two clusters, a green cluster and a yellow cluster around this region and MESC and N NPC merged to a single yellow cluster in CN. And when we look at the RNA uh, seq levels normalized to TPM across uh, samples here in a heat map, we observed uh, differential gene expression in and around uh, the fused clusters here, accompanied by a change in histone modification levels that are so that is associated with active enhancer activity. So that's H3K 27AC. You see kind of how the peak patterns changes, uh, especially in CN. So uh, taking this all together in conclusion, uh, we've developed a multitask factorization method uh, called TGIF to detect changes in IC matrices from multiple biological contexts. Uh, we find that TGIF effectively recovers ground truth clusters and simulated data and biologically salient changes across multiple structural scales in real high sea data. Um, now we plan to further refine our methods so that first we can identify and summarize statistically significant changes across multiple conditions. And we wanna measure kind of the association between the changes detected by TGIF and changes in regulatory signals known to affect the genome organization. So for instance, like histone modification levels or transcription factor binding. And then we can use those measures and metrics to not only scan for the best combination of hyperparameters and tree structures, but we also wanna be able to systematically benchmark TGIF with uh, existing methods for detecting uh, structural changes in high c data. So I'd like to thank uh, my advisor, Sushmita, and the members of Team Roy. Uh, although we are working apart remotely, they're basically keeping me sane and productive. And of course, we're able to do our research thanks to, thanks to the funding from NIH and the computing infrastructure that's maintained by uh, the Center of High Throughput Computing here at University of Wisconsin. Uh, and I know I will, I'll be happy to answer any questions, but if there are any questions, comments, and feedbacks that I didn't get to uh, or you didn't get to share, especially for those on the streaming, please feel free to send a tweet to me and Sushmita. Um, those are our handles. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Diane. Really nice talk. Um, so I'll just make an announcement for the um, viewers uh, while um, you're typing your question. So, you know, in the, the QA function, you can upweight certain questions. So if you see other questions that you like, you can upweight them and then uh, they'll go on top of the list. Um, but while you guys are thinking, um, let me ask you one question. So um, in terms of, so your, your model basically tries to learn shared structure across multiple um, related data set. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, I guess, is there a danger if the, if the structures are really different across um, contexts um, and, and how, how would you handle that? That's a great question. So in fact, when we looked at the benchmarking with uh, the ground, when we have the data sets with known ground truth clusters, having a slightly more um, complex tree structure didn't really give a very noticeable boost against the, just like having a flat tree structure where you have one parent across multiple tasks. So our hypothesis currently that we are trying, that we want to test is in fact, this might be more beneficial if you do have like a much stronger task uh, heterogeneity and that's somehow captured in the tree. And that's when you might actually see the benefit of using a tree versus just kind of sharing information uniformly across all the tasks. But that's something that, yeah, we're looking to looking forward to test. But that's a great question. Okay, um, cool. So you have two more questions. Uh, one from Max um, Liebricht. Oh, sorry, the one from Irene Kaplow just got upgraded. So I'll start with that one. Um, so, hey, <laughs> what's going on? Okay, so we'll do Irene's first and then we'll go to Max. Did good. you try comparing TGIF to network diffusion methods? Interesting. So when we, I'm, I'm going to assume uh, when Irene says network diffusion methods, um, 
it's kind of about actually smoothing out the um, the the network, and we can treat the high C matrix as a network between you know different genomic regions. Um, so that's often used actually as a pre-processing step, especially for very noisy and very sparse high C matrices. Um, I am not aware of how to directly use uh, network diffusion methods to compare across multiple uh, contexts. There are network alignment methods that uses diffuse networks, denoise networks that try to align it and then tries to find um, changes among the network structure. Uh, this is oftentimes used in dynamic uh, gene regulatory network detection. But um, yeah, for network diffusion, I'm not sure exactly how I would do it. Um, I will get in touch with you somehow <laughs> to Irene and see if the, uh, she has any methods in mind that we can uh, further benchmark to. That would be cool. Great. Yeah, it's easy to find Irene. I think you can look her up. <laughs> cool. um, all right. um, from question from Max, how does TGIF handle the dependence of high C on distance and intra versus interchromosomal context? Mm. Uh, for example, do you see chromosome specific clusters? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Max. So um, when we're detecting uh, so depending on the task that you have in mind, uh, we will basically use different resolution of the high C data. So if we're trying to detect chromosome level, uh, chromosome level rearrangements or kind of large structural variants, then when we use the entire genome-wide um, high C matrix, um, including both the inter intra-chromosomal and inter inter-chromosomal um, interactions. And in that case, it doesn't really, uh, we don't do anything additional to handle it. Uh, it's just, we, you kind of see the block diagonal structures. Each block essentially is a, um, it corresponds to a single chromosome, but if there's chromosomal rearrangements, TGIO will pick that up. And we don't do anything to try to account for it or to deal with that. Um, within, uh, so if we're trying to find TAD level changes or compartmental level changes, that's when we kind of zoom into a single chromosome and use a much more high level, uh, higher resolution high C matrix. In that case, yes, you definitely see it even more pronounced now that you've zoomed in, you see a very pronounced kind of diagonal streak, I want to say, um, that uh, kind of represents what Max is referring to as kind of the dependence that nearby regions tend to interact a lot more with each other. Uh, we also don't do, have to do anything to handle that. In fact, um, we have a paper under review. The method is called Grinch uh, that does single task graph regularized um, NMF. So it's not doing multitask. We just kind of do it one per task. And we find that um, Grinch actually handles kind of this distance dependence well. And in fact, that's codified in our graph when we use a neighborhood graph. So we kind of, in fact, leverage that information, but we're not um, hurt by the um, kind of the streak pattern that we see. Cool, and I see. Um, okay, and then that's just um, Irene sending you a pointer. Ah, thank um, you. Okay, so thank you so much, everybody. You're a little bit behind on the schedule, so we won't take the full break. Uh, so you have six minutes until the next talk. Uh, and while you're kind of taking a break, maybe I'll quickly just say that for everybody that's presenting in the next today, make sure you are logged in as a panelist. That, that way you can share your screen and we can see you. Um, so if you are presenting and you're not a panelist, uh, please get in touch ASAP so I can um, add you. All right, so we'll be back in six minutes and then we'll get started at 1040 with another oral presentation.
Antonio, you're now you're now a panelist. I can see your video and everything. So you're good. Sounds great. Thank you. Are panelists able to submit questions to the Q and A? Yeah, absolutely. You should see a Q and A um, uh, like I, option at the bottom. I see a Q and A tab, I was, but I don't see how to submit questions. I was trying Avanti and couldn't couldn't either. So I okay. think you just have to do it like you did through the chat. Okay, cool. It's slightly odd, actually, right? Oh, that's true. Interesting. It I makes guess sense. Of course, I'm able to do it. Um, <laughs> I guess I guess maybe because the panelists can just speak and like unmute themselves, they have don't have that option. Um, but yeah, right. But that <laughs> that feels like cheating, right? You're not getting in the queue with everyone else. So. Yeah. So just an announcement, everybody. Um, so we, we send a Zoom link um, to the everybody that's registered now. So there's about 1,100 of you that registered that you should have received received the Zoom link um, in case you're watching on YouTube and you want to and you've registered before. Now you can um, log into Zoom. That way you can ask your questions uh, more directly and we can see it. So it's 10:40. We'll get get started with another session of um, really exciting talks. Uh, first one is uh, Antonio Moretti, um, and he's going to tell us about um, variational combinatorial sequence Monte Carlo for Bayesian phylogenetic inference. Uh, thank you. Just trying to unmute myself here. Hi, guys. Uh, so I'm Antonio. I'll talk about uh, variational CSMC for Bayesian phylogenetic inference. Uh, this is joint work with Li Zhang and Itzik Pierre at Columbia University. So uh, Bayesian phylogenetic inference plays the central role in molecular evolutionary biology because it represents evolutionary uncertainty and helps us quantify prior information. Um, in this setup, the goal uh, given a set of molecular sequences or data is to reconstruct evolutionary history. So in this case, the data is DNA, RNA, or protein. So more formally, what we want is to infer this latent bifurcating tree, tau. So this tree has special properties. So at the leaf nodes, I've denoted one one character across, let's say, the, the, the genome. Um, so this tree has branch lengths that are positive numbers. Uh, the topology is defined by a connected acyclic graph with vertices and edges, where the leaf nodes represent the observed taxa. This is where the, the data enters. They have degree one. The internal nodes represent unobserved taxa or the ancestral taxa. So what we're interested in is distributions over characters for, for uh, the, the ancestors, uh, which have degree three, so two children and one parent. Uh, and then finally, we're interested in a root node, which is this common evolutionary ancestor of, of, of all taxa. Uh, we're also interested in what are called non-clock trees, which have this assumption that there, there doesn't have to be a non-constant evolutionary rate. So the, the path from root to leaf uh, doesn't need to uh, sum to the same thing for, for different nodes. Right? Uh, these are kind of more pertinent for biologists. Um, so given a, a tree, given a phylogeny, which is defined by this directly acyclic graph and this set of branch lengths, on data, so y1 through ym. So in order, to, in order to do some kind of inference, we need a model to define the probability of data on a tree, so to define the likelihood. And this, in this instance, it's independent over sites. We need to define some probability of transition between the characters. Uh, in this instance, it's defined by a continuous time Markov chain with a rate matrix Q. 
And then in order to evaluate the probability of a transition, we just take the branch length, we multiply that with the rate matrix, and we exponentiate to evaluate the probability of going from a node V to V prime, right? Indexing into the, the components of the rate matrix. So we have a way to compute the likelihood, just, just as a review here. So we can compute the likelihood with this formula. And because this is this kind of graphical model and involves this marginalization over, over characters, uh, there's a clever way to do this where we rearrange sums. Uh, and this algorithm has different names. It's called sum product or belief propagation, or in the context of phylogenetics, it's called Felsenstein's pruning algorithm. So just as a review, the idea here is we pass messages from, from leaf nodes to the root iteratively, and we're looking at messages from the left and the right children, and we're, we're marginalizing, we're doing this marginalization in a, in, a, in a computationally efficient way. Okay, so, so now we have a way of evaluating a likelihood given a topology, but uh, the Bayesian approach is really interested in this, this uncertainty that there are many different tree topologies. So in fact, there are 2n minus 3 double factorial topologies that you can evaluate. So there's a huge uh, combinatorial space of possible trees. Uh, the, the Bayesian setup really is interested in this posterior distribution over tree topologies, uh, which can be expressed as this likelihood term times a prior over topologies and branch lengths and a prior over parameters. So in this case, our parameters are the continuous time Markov chain, so the rate matrix, as well as the, the parameters of branch lengths. So we may want the branch lengths to be parameterized using independent exponential distributions with some rate. So there's some lambda for each of these. And, and since it's a non-clock tree, uh, we have many of these parameters to learn. Um, so just from a comp uh, computational point of view, we have our likelihood, we have our tree and model priors and our evidence. And marginalizing here is intractable for two reasons. So one, we're dealing with a composite space. So it's a space of uh, uh, discrete tree topologies as well as a continuous space over branch lengths. And we have this intractable summation over tree topologies, as well as an integral over, over the branch lengths in order to marginalize to get rid of the, the hidden variables in this setup. So this is, this is where the intractability comes from. This is what is, what is hard in the setup. Um, so just to recap, before we, we talk about the contributions, there are several distinct challenges here, right? So there's, there's the challenge of what I call inference or marginalization, right? So that has to deal with uh, this intractable summation over tree topologies. It can often be done by sampling. Uh, and then for a topology, you also need to deal with this integral over branch lengths. So we need to marginalize over the discrete and continuous components of this composite space. Uh, and then we may also be interested in uh, what I call learning or parameter optimization, model learning, model fitting. So, so what, what exactly is this Q matrix that, that governs this transition between characters? Uh, what are the parameters for branch lengths? Uh, so, so in this setup, uh, the parameters are that Q matrix and then the, the lambdas that define the exponential. Um, and so in learning, we wanna find these parameterized that maximize the data likelihood uh, this is somewhat of a chicken and egg problem because the likelihood, the marginal likelihood involves this intractable inference problem of, of dealing with summations and integrals. Um, so there are really two families of approximate inference algorithms that tackle this problem. Uh, and I find a useful way to think about them is uh, in terms of local search. So Markov chain Monte Carlo or random walk Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, is a member of a kind of local search algorithm where you look at, you start with a complete tree and then maybe we perturb something about the tree. We change a branch length, we change an edge. Uh, and we look at, uh, we need to evaluate the likelihood using uh, Felsenstein's pruning algorithm and look at this ratio of target over proposal and see if the area that we've moved to has higher probability than the area that we were, right? So we're doing this kind of diffusion on, on this composite space of, of phylogenetic trees. and and uh, you know this, uh, it, you know you can show that this converges to um, uh, uh, the distribution of interest, right? Um, so, 
So it's important to note that local search, MCMC here, can be used for both inference and learning. So I can sample from a discrete space and sample from a continuous space using MCMC. And then MCMC can also be used in a way for optimization by doing this kind of random walk on the parameter space. So perturbing the values of the parameters until, until, until my Markov chain converges. Right. Um, so there are a family of uh, uh, tools for this, right? So Mr. Bayes is, is kind of a famous random walk MCMC implementation. Uh, I should note that in Mr. Bayes, I believe the, the task is really inference, not so much learning the Q matrix is just, is just um, has a uniform probability across transitions. Uh, there are more sophisticated ways to, to deal with MCMC. For example, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or this recent work on probabilistic path. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, where you kind of deal with curvature of parameter space uh, and try to avoid getting stuck in local optima. Right? Um, so this is MCMC, is a, a local search algorithm. Uh, the other approach you could take is sequential search, right? So in sequential search uh, or sequential Monte Carlo, uh, what you're doing is you're performing inference. So you're marginalizing, you get an unbiased estimate of the data likelihood of the marginal likelihood. Uh, but you need to use some MCMC step or some EM step for learning. Uh, and so a sophisticated family of algorithms that came out uh, called particle MCMC essentially uses sequential Monte Carlo to write down an unbiased estimate of the marginal likelihood. So there's one SMC step and then there's one MCMC step on the actual parameters. So using SMC for inference and then MCMC for, for learning. Uh, so one example of this for Bayesian phylogenetics is something called combinatorial sequential Monte Carlo. That's, that's what we'll build on. Uh, and then there are also these nice family of connections between variational inference and sequential Monte Carlo, where you use sequential Monte Carlo to essentially form an elbow. So you form a lower bound on the log likelihood and then you optimize that. So, so it's a way of using sequential Monte Carlo to do variational inference and simultaneously do both inference and learning. Uh, so these are kind of uh, difficult setups because you're dealing with this complex multimodal distribution on this composite space of, of phylogenetic trees. Uh, so quickly, in a nutshell, variational inference is a way of approximating an intractable distribution with a tractable distribution, and in doing so, trade integration for optimization. So the cost function vi the elbow essentially involves an integral or an expectation. So there's an element of marginalization there. And in doing so, you exploit this hidden symmetry, whereby minimizing this KL divergence between Q and P is the same thing as maximizing this, this, this lower bound called the elbow. Uh, so, so this work builds on combinatorial sequential Monte Carlo, and the novelty is in using combinatorial sequential Monte Carlo, an inference technique to define a variational objective, and seeing how that's different from classical filtered variational objectives because we're dealing with this composite space. Um, so combinatorial sequential Monte Carlo builds trees by sampling nodes and branch lengths. So we'll sample from a partially ordered set. We'll pick two nodes to coalesce with a given probability will assign a probability or an importance weight to a partial state. And it's important to note that here, uh, there's not a direct way of evaluating the likelihood. So Feldenstein's algorithm gives you a way of evaluating the likelihood of a complete phylogeny. What we have right here on this on this chain of ABCD is, is just A and B together. That's, that's not a complete phylogeny, right? So uh, we, there's a technical point, uh, which I'll come back to. Um, and essentially, there's a resampling step where we focus uh, the computation of areas corresponding to high probability mass. Uh, so we're going to iterate not over time points in this instance, but over rank events. And uh, you can just see how we build this tree sequentially for a number of samples, right? Uh, so K sampled partial states are drawn from a proposal distribution at each rank event. Uh, I have a way of computing an estimate of this probability measure using the importance weights and a Kronecker delta. And the weights are really this, this ratio of the target over the target at the previous time point uh, divided by the proposal, this plus term. And then there's an overcounting correction, which you can read about in the, in the Wang paper. Uh, resampling states conditioned on previous states 
ensures that the variance of the importance weight scales linearly as opposed to exponentially across time points. So we're left with this unbiased estimate of the marginal likelihood. Uh, and the idea here is to approximate this posterior to do the, the model learning part uh, by forming a lower bound to the data marginal likelihood, uh, whereby maximizing the elbow is, is, is equivalent to minimizing this KL between uh, the, the proposal, in this case, the, the recognition model or inference network, and the target, in this case, the, the generative model. Um, so we're, we're, we're left with um, an unbiased estimate of the marginal likelihood. And just by Jensen's inequality, you can see that you get a lower bound on that by swapping the log and the expectation. Uh, so this is, this is written in TensorFlow. Um, and a few technical challenges here that I'll mention are that uh, essentially because this is a latent variable model, you can think of it as a kind of autoencoder. And in doing some kind of autoencoding variational Bayes or reparameterization, there's a nice way to handle discrete random, I mean, continuous random variables, reparameterizing. Uh, but uh, discrete random variables is a little trickier. So, so the two approaches you can take are to drop the discrete terms from the gradient estimate. So you end up with bias gradient estimates or uh, alternatively to redefine Gumbel softmax random variables. So when I sample, so when we sample uh, two nodes to coalesce, I'm picking from a uniform random variable. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm taking minus log, minus log of a uniform and shifting with gumbel noise. Um, so let's, uh, oh, another point that I should mention here is uh, essentially in how we evaluate, uh, I'll go back for a second, how we evaluate the likelihood of a partial state. So um, we know how we evaluate the likelihood on a complete phylogeny. Maybe I'll go back to the Felsenstein's pruning algorithm quickly here. Uh, and that's done by passing messages from leaf node to root. And then finally, the last step in this formula is essentially to take the inner product uh, of the message at the root node with uh, eta, which is the stationary state of the Q matrix, right? So what I'm left with at each uh, internal node is a distribution over characters and including the root, I'm left with a distribution over characters. And I wanna go from a distribution to a probability and that's done by, by, by taking the inner product with eta, right? So when I sample partial states, um, I haven't yet assigned a probability to, to a partial state if what I'm left with is a distribution over, in this case, the parent of A and B, right? So, so, one, so, so the technical challenge here is an extension of the measure, the, tar the measure on uh, complete phylogenies to a measure on partial states. There are more partial states than there are complete uh, phylogenies, right? And so one way to do this is to treat all uh, disjoint elements of uh, the jump chain here as independent and to essentially take the, the product of each of these elements with uh, eta, the stationary distribution of the Markov chain, and then multiply everything together. So that extension is called the natural forest extension. And it has the advantage of passing information from all taxa into the local weight update, right? Um, there are other ways you could assign an extension uh, of this measure uh, from um, complete phylogenies to partial states. Uh, that's a kind of an open question. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a quick look at um, some initial results here. So this is uh, on primate mitochondrial DNA. So uh, essentially there are 12 taxa of uh, different kinds of human, chimp, gorillas, and uh, apes. Um, and what we see here is the log likelihood estimate uh, as the number of samples increases. So you see with four samples on the left, I get a lower log likelihood estimate with more stochastic gradient noise. And as I increase the number of samples, I converge to a higher log likelihood estimate um, with less stochastic gradient noise. Uh, and as a comparison, probabilistic path Hamiltonian Monte Carlo 
is, is run on this data. Um, on the right, um, I probably should have put the names of the actual taxa here, but uh, you partition, so the data is basically partitioned into clades where you have uh, old world monkeys, new world monkeys, human, chimp, gorilla, uh, and um, uh, two more taxa. Um, so, so once again, you get a distribution over phylogenies, and this is one that's sampled with probability according to the importance weight at the, the final step. Um, so to recap, uh, this is the first method that uses sequential Monte Carlo to define a variational objective on this composite space of non-clock phylogenetic trees. Um, we see that we get suitable estimates of the log likelihood as the number of samples increases. This is a multi-sample objective, uh, like an I-way except with a resampling step. Um, and uh, some interesting extensions would be to look at uh, beta coronavirus data, for example. So um, maybe a, an interesting direction for future work. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's, I guess I'll open it up for questions. I don't know how I'm doing on time here. But, uh. Uh, thank you so much, Antonio, for a really clear talk. There's one minute for questions and we have one question. One question. So um, let's get to that from Khalil. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. In the model, are the branch length parameters learned as well? Yes, the branch length parameters are learned as well. Uh, for not, so it's okay. a non clock pilot, yeah. All right, um, so for interest of time, we'll move on to the next um, speaker in this um, session. So um, that is Mohit Goya. You can go ahead and start sharing your screen. And um, the talk is gonna be about um, joint, dis joint integration and discrimination for automated single cell annotation. Uh, hi, uh, can, Antonio, can you unshare your screen? Yeah, sorry, let me pull my, let's see what I'm here. So we actually decided to not do pre-recorded because live talks work a lot better. And so far it's been smooth. So thank you everybody for um, kind of being on time and um, being here and also being flexible when we run um, late for one or two minutes. We can go ahead. Um, so is my screen visible? Yeah, we can see your screen on your mouse. Okay, uh, good. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Mohit. Uh, today I'm going to present our work, Genes, Joint Integration and Discrimination for Automated Single Cell Annotation. This is joint work with my collaborators, Guillermo, Ilan, Mikhail, and my advisor, Edoya. So I think most of us present over here can agree that a lot of single cell rna data is being generated and many applications have already come up and new applications are coming in every day. But one of the first and foremost step in all of the pipelines that utilize this data is of cell characterization, which basically means identifying uh, the cell type for each and every cell in the data. Traditionally, this is done using unsupervised clustering algorithms. And uh, this is followed by use of expert knowledge to determine the cell type of each cluster. Now it has been shown that annotations produced in this manner are very hard to reproduce and very sensitive to the kind of clustering method used. So if you take out a few cells from the data or you, or you change the data distribution slightly, the clusters might change and, and so will your cell types. But uh, at this point of time, many annotated data sets are present which have been annotated by experts. And these data sets if combined with supervised machine learning techniques, they present a natural framework to annotate more data sets because this is a classic uh, a classification problem. So the question is, is supervised machine learning a better alternative to do this? So uh, let's look at data-driven annotation of single cell data sets. So we have a source batch where the annotations are known and the objective is to label a new target batch where the annotations are uh, not known. Now somebody might just uh, try to use off the shelf classifiers because this is a classification task. Turns out uh, there are a few problems uh, with using them. First of all, uh, depending on how the data was collected, how the library was prepared, the two data sets might have different kinds of technical variabilities, which will lead to batch effects. So as you can see in the figure, the two, the two data sets have completely different distribution. 
and for that we need an external algorithm which can do batch correction and then we can do joint analysis on these data sets the second issue is uh, unlike standard classification tasks each cell might not belong to a distinct cell type as we know that cells can undergo differentiation and might transition from one state to the other uh, the cells can exist in intermediate stages uh, and so we get clusters like this uh, forming a trajectory or something and it gets difficult to uh, classify cells at the boundary so one way to handle this is to just say that uh, we, we are not going to say anything about these cells and basically do not assign any kind of label to these cells so uh, there already exist many tools which can do data driven annotation such as cirrus actin scfred scm reject and many more and generally there are three components to these methods the first is a pre processing step where we take the source batch and the target batch and project them onto a common space where the distributions are similar then the second step is to train a supervised classifier on the modified source batch and the third step is inference where we predict the cell types uh, on the target batch and by doing so wherever we encounter predictions which are of low confidence we just label them as unassigned however there are uh, two issues that we find with these methods first of all uh, if you remember the, the the ordering is like this you first perform batch integration then you perform classifier training and then you do inference now whenever a new target batch comes in you will have to repeat the second process every time and that is inefficient what we would like is to have our classifier fixed and only do batch integration followed by cell type inference that would save a lot of time the second problem is with the rejection scheme whenever we reject cells uh, most of the existing methods use fixed threshold such as a threshold of 0.9 whenever your threshold whenever your confidence is below 0.9 you will label it as unassigned but different data sets might can have different complexities and different cell types can also have different complexities and therefore a fixed threshold is not optimal so in light of these issues we present genes uh, joint integration and neural discrimination and our main contributions are as follows so firstly gene uses a novel asymmetric gan based batch alignment method where we do not need to re uh, retrain the classifier every time our second contribution is that we do not use fixed thresholds but we estimate cell type specific threshold for every data set and and we utilize those in our rejection scheme third uh, we have gene plus which is kind of an extension of gene and it's just like a additional step that you can perform after doing everything and it is based on self training on the predictions made on the target batch and it kind of improves performance as we'll show in our results so let's look at the asymmetric batch alignment a little closely so just to remind you the idea is to fix the classifier and only do batch correction uh, at test time so we have a source batch uh, we have genes and we we know the cell types now we train a classifier which is based on a neural network specifically we have two sub networks an encoder and a classifier the encoder takes in the gene expressions and predicts a low dimensional latent code then the classifier looks at the latent code and can produce cell types now what we propose is to produce the latent codes for the target batch as well and somehow align them to the latent codes over here and never change the classifier so as you can see on the right hand side this is what we have initially uh we have the source batch and the target batch latent codes and what we can see is that they do not overlap now we assume that there is a underlying mapping in the latent space and if we can uncover that mapping we can just apply that mapping onto the target batch so that the distributions are aligned and then we can use the aligned latent code plus the classifier to get the cell types for the target batch so Uh, specifically we use uh, adversarial alignment uh, this is <clears throat> inspired from the methods of domain adaptation in computer vision we have our source batch latent codes we have our target batch latent codes but as we know that they might in general not have a similar distribution so what we want to do is we want to align the latent codes for the target batch which 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 is denoted by this such that the latent code for the source batch and this aligned latent code they have the same distribution and to do this we use a pair of generator and a discriminator 
the generator takes in the latent code for the target batch and produces this aligned latent code. The objective of the discriminator is to look at the latent code and tell whether it is coming from the source batch, it's a source batch latent code, or it is the output of the generator. And the objective of the generator is to fool the discriminator into believing that its output is basically source latent code. And after we train them alternatively, uh, this tra training is finished. Uh, we can use this generator to transform the latent code for the target batch with, and get this aligned latent code. And then we can just use our classifier to produce the cell types. Note that we do not change uh, this encoder or the classifier during this step. So let's look at a data set uh, and, and look at the performance of gene batch alignment. So we have pancreas data set. Uh, we are going to visualize the latent code distributions before and after alignment. So this is what we have uh, before alignment. As we can see that the source clusters and the target clusters do not correspond to each other. But after we do alignment, every target cluster is mapped onto one of the source clusters. Note that this is done in a completely unsupervised manner. And uh, we, we notice that this mapping is actually the right one. When we evaluate the performance of our classifier uh, before alignment, we see that many of the cells uh, from alpha and many of the cells from beta uh, are rejected, basically labeled as unassigned because the confidence in the prediction is not high enough. But after we do this alignment, the same classifier uh, only rejects a small proportion of the cells, which basically means that uh, this batch alignment does work. So we do a qu quantitative comparison with the uh, existing methods. We have three data sets over here. Uh, each of them have batch effects. We are going to use three metrics, the raw accuracy, uh, the rejection rate, which is the percentage of cells that, that are rejected due to uh, low confidence, and the effective accuracy, which is the accuracy on the remaining cells. So first let's compare gene and gene plus. Uh, so we see that gene and gene plus performs similar in, in, in the terms of raw accuracy and gene plus is slightly better. But if you look at the rejection rates, the rejection rates are almost half. That means you're going to lose out on half the number of cells. So that is the gene plus is slightly uh, a better alternative. Uh, now we compare against CUREP label transfer, which is a part of the CUREP library. We see that on PBMC data set, the performance is slightly better for CUREP, but we are close enough. On the other two data sets, we see that the performance of gene plus is significantly better. And, and that means uh, our batch alignment is actually superior uh, to what CUREP LT does. Uh, we also compare with three other methods, SVM reject, SC thread, and actin. Uh, note that uh, these methods do not have a batch integration module. So we use CUREP integration uh, and provide numbers for both with and without integration. So if it do not perform integration, we see that a large fraction of the cells get end up getting rejected uh, in all of the three methods. And uh, in terms of raw accuracy, while the cells are not rejected, the performance is, uh, while it is similar on PBMC data set, the performance is not as good on pancreas data sets. If we use CUREP integration before running these three methods, we see that the rejection rates uh, reduce a lot, but in some cases they do not, and the rejection rates are still very high. But even after integration, if we compare the raw accuracies, uh, on pancreas datasets, the performance is still high for gene plus. Lastly, uh, we also conduct differential expression analysis. The idea over here is to look at the mistakes made by our classifier and try to understand uh, what, what happens over there. Is it some kind of noise that is being captured or is it, uh, is it a genuine mistake? So we, we, we take PBMC data set, uh, we look at uh, the, the two cell types, monocyte FCGR3A and monocyte CD14. As you can see that uh, there's a lot of confusion at this intersection. So we try to conduct the exp differential expression analysis over here. So we specifically choose two groups. One is where the monocytes are correctly classified, monocyte FCGR3A are correctly classified as monocyte FCGR3A. And the other group is where these monocyte FCGR3As are misclassified as monocyte CD40. Now, if everything was okay and, and it was a mistake made by our classifier, then ideally these two groups should not uh, express differential genes. But that is not the case. As we can see that based on the gene expressions, we can 
uh, separate these two groups out. So this purple group is the G1 and the orange group is G2. Moreover, when we look at two marker genes, FCGR3A and CD14, we see that these marker genes are uh, un like differently expressed in these two groups. And this basically shows that these are not, this is not some noise that is being captured by a classifier. And it is essentially, uh, it, it, can, it can potentially be some data set annotation noise. Uh, and and, and th that is our main conclusion. So to summarize, we have uh, Gene Plus, which provides state-of-the-art performance on the task of data set annotation. Secondly, we show that our rejection rates are consistent across experiments. Um, Note that, note that you can control the amount of rejection rate easily. Our implementation uh, for gene batch alignment can be done on CPUs and GPUs. Even on CPUs, we are approximately five to six times faster than zeroth symmetric batch alignment, which is uh, already inefficient because of being symmetric in nature. Fourth, uh, our differential expression analysis reveals that there might be potential noise in the cell type annotations. Lastly, there, there's one thing that we do not discuss over here is what happens when a new cell type is introduced in the target batch. Now, if, if there is a new cell type, then you can not directly align these two distributions. And it is interesting to see what happens over there. And what we show that uh, uh, while Gene makes a lot, uh, Gene misclassifies all those cells, our mapping uh, learned by, by the GAN is actually still meaningful. Uh, and if you're interested, you can go look, uh, look at our preprint, which is available on BioArchive. So thank you everyone. Our implementation is available on GitHub. Our preprint pre is available on BioArchive. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Marie. Right on time. We have actually a couple of minutes for questions. Um, so um, we can wait a little bit as people are thinking about it and typing, but I'm sure there's many people that work on single cell data and alignment is a really big problem. So. Um, Let's see, don't be shy, you can ask questions. So here comes a couple. First one from Youngjin Park. How do you handle doublets? Uh, so can you explain uh, what do you mean by doublets? Um, so doublets is when um, you know, it's actually a single cell is not a single cell. It's, it's two cells that are merged and you're seeing the signal from both of them. And, and you don't know what, what doublet, you don't know which cells are doublets. Right, right, right. So I think uh, there are a lot of corner cases like this. And while we cannot uh, specifically change or, or while we do not specifically detect these doublets, but what we prefer is to look at the probability estimates that we get from our classifier. And we hope that uh, we, the estimates would be poorer in this case. Now, uh, they might not be. And in, the, in this case, you, you would have to deal with misclassifications, I think. OK, thank you. Two more questions. Um, one from Omi. Have you used VAE for latent variable estimation? Uh, no, we do not use VA. We use uh, GAN, which is Generative Adversarial Network. Uh, so we, I think the, the main difference uh, in VA and GAN is that you do not explicitly model uh, the data distribution in the latent space. So, so no, we do not use VA. And you, I guess the answer is that you haven't compared them either. You so, haven't so, compared them. Oh, I see. So. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a method which, so there, there, is, a, there is a method, I think uh, you're referring to SCVI, uh, which does latent uh, variable estimation in, in the latent space, but they do not uh, uh, have a method for cell, cell classification, but uh, we can essentially use their model to, for batch correction and then use some other model for classification. And that, that is something that, that is useful, uh, thanks a lot. Okay, um, question from Gallup. Can you use this method to align single cells from different technologies? For instance, single cell ATAC and single cell RNA-seq. So, so uh, is this question in the chat? Because I cannot see in the, 
So this is the, the panelist um, QA. Okay. Okay. Uh, so so that's a that's a very good question. Uh, this is something that we recently tried. Uh, and one of the issues with single cell RNA and uh, SE, SE attack sick, uh, data is that their scales uh, vary a lot. Now, ideally, like I've seen uh, people doing batch alignment with two different kinds of data, which is SE RNA and SE attack. But in our, in, in our, in our framework, you cannot directly use it because this encoder is expecting uh, data at least at the same scale. Now, if you like, because I recently saw data which end up the scale varies like in 10 to the power six order of magnitudes. So uh, that, that is one reason that you cannot directly use it, but we are, we are trying to, uh, but it, it would be sep separate uh, project, but you can use it, I think. Yeah. Okay, and then last question from Alan. Can you explain the architecture of the generator? Any sense of what sort of transformation is being inferred to handle the domain shift? Yeah, uh, that, that's again a good question. Uh, uh, I, I think it's slightly involved uh, and for, for more details, I, I would suggest go take a look at our preprint. But what we use is uh, in abstract terms is we model the latent space uh, uh, as sort of a nonlinear shift. So we model two, two quantities, which is a bias and scale. And we predict the bias and scale for every cell type in target batch that would lead to alignment. Uh, but, but again, like you should go and look at the preprint because it's slightly involved. And that is very important for, for all of this to work. And good question. OK, since we have one more minute, I'll ask you the last question from Ethan. How sensitive was the GAN to hyperparameter changes? Yeah. Uh, so I would agree that GANs are very unstable because of the nature of their objective function. But uh, the, so we tried actually many techniques because this doesn't directly work. Uh, and at the end, like this, this we, we tried a very simple thing, which is uh, we penalize a generator uh, with L2 penalty and, and the, the penalty magnitude is very high. After doing that, uh, this, this loss converges and, and it basically converges in every data set that, that we tested on. Uh, I don't have a theoretical reason as to why penalizing a generator would make everything uh, work, but that is, that is one insight that we got into it and, and maybe if you're working on something like this uh, you can you can try penalizing the generator uh, because the, the task of discriminator is very easy if there are batch effects but generator for generator to learn the kind of noise that is there in the data set is kind of very hard uh, so to avoid overfitting you might want to penalize the generator um, yeah okay thank you so much Mohit. Um, i'll hand it over to suen uh, another organizer who will be moderating the, the next few talks. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay. Um, all right, hi. Um, so the next talk will be um, um, Pinar, Pinar Dimechi. Yeah. Hi. Hi, yeah, she's going to talk about a new method to align um, single cell multi omic data. Okay. Um, do you see my pointer? I'm curious if, I, if I'm able to point at stuff. Yeah, we, we see it. Okay, thank you. All right, so yeah, um, I'm Panar and I'm a graduate student at Brown University and I'll be talking about our work on a unsupervised alignment algorithm for single cell multiomics data integration using gromo wasserstein optimal transport. So with the availability of various sequencing technologies, we're now able to capture different properties of the genome at the single cell level, such as um, transcriptomic and epigenomic states. This is useful to get a holistic view of the single cell genome and perhaps study things like um, the mechanism of gene regulation or cellular heterogeneity from different genomic perspectives. But um, with very few exceptions, applying different technologies on the same single cell is difficult. And for some combinations of the sequencing assays that need to access the same part of the genome, uh, it's currently not possible at all. In addition, one cannot sequentially apply these methods on the same single cell either. Uh, 
because a cell is destroyed after any of these sequencing procedures. So what we tend to do as a result is um, divide a population of cell of interest into different aliquots and then apply a different sequencing assay on each of these. And then to perform a joint multiomic analysis, we would need to integrate these data sets. But this is a challenging problem. First of all, we don't have any information on one-to-one um, -one correspondences between cells from these different data sets. And we often don't have that for features either because we um, measured different properties of the genome in different cells. So this process yields disparate data sets with no information on alignment a priori. As a result, we need unsupervised algorithms that will um, align them without relying on any correspondence information. Previously, one way people have addressed this challenge is by embedding data sets in a shared manifold. In this case, we assume that data sets share a manifold because we have measurements from uh, cells that come from the same population. So they will likely share some genealogy and um, will probably have similar cell type composition as well. There are two unsupervised al alignment algorithms currently that take this approach, MMDMA and UNUCOM. While both of them have demonstrated quality alignment results, um, they require the users to tune three and four hyperparameters respectively. Unfortunately, hyper hyperparameter tuning can be difficult to do in an unsupervised setting where um, when we have sequencing data from different aliquots and no validation data on alignments to use for the tuning. So in our work, we demonstrate an algorithm that's more convenient to use in a fully unsupervised setting while still performing competitively with MMDMA and UNICOM in terms of alignment quality. Instead of the embedding idea employed by these two algorithms, we approach this problem using optimal transport theory instead. Um, optimal transport generally aims to transform one probability distribution into another in a cost-efficient way by solving for a probabilistic coupling matrix. Um, this matrix describes how the two distributions are related to one another. In our case, we work with data sets with discrete samples. So what we do is we define empirical probability distributions over these samples and work with these. Then the interpretation of the coupling matrix for our discrete case is um, the probability of correspondences between data points from each domain. And this gives us a transportation plan to align uh, data points from the two domains. In the um, classic optimal transport formulation, the cost function for the optimization is defined over the data points themselves directly, comparing samples across domains. But this requires that the data from the both domains live in the same metric space. This assumption does not hold true in our uh, application, since we work with um, different measures from different sequencing assays. Uh, so the feature space is different. So we use another formulation called Gromov-Wasserstein optimal transport, which allows us to work with data from different metric spaces. In this formulation, the cost function is defined over the intra-domain distances using Gromov-Wasserstein distance. And with this, we compare pairwise sample distances in the two domains instead of the samples themselves. And when solving for the correspondence matrix, uh, we consider how to move a pair of points from one domain to the other. Using this formulation um, also helps us preserve some local geometry since relative pairwise distances between the samples are preserved upon um, alignments. So we named our method SCOT as an abbreviation for single cell alignments with optimal transport. And here is how it works. Given two domains, uh, we first compute intra-domain distances to be used in the Gromov-Wasserstein distance computation. I, like I just explained. Um, we do this by constructing k-nearest neighbor graphs based on correlations between the samples and then um, computing shortest distances between the samples on this graph. We choose to use k and n graph, uh, graphs because we observe that it also helps us uh, preserve some local geometry during the alignment and yield, yields better uh, alignment results in comparison to something like pairwise Euclidean distances. Then given these matrices and the empirical distributions, we solve the following optimization problem, where the goal is to find uh, the coupling matrix gamma. And um, each entry in gamma tells us how the probability, what the probability, probability is 
of aligning a sample from domain X from the other samples in the domain Y. Um, and we find these by comparing the uh, pairwise distances. And we assign probabilities between these uh, points that will minimize this Pair, minimize the pairwise distances among alignments. Um, intuitively, what this captures is um, how moving, for example, points xi in the x domain to yj and xk onto yl um, disturbs the distorts original geometry, and we want minimal distortion. Uh, I just realized that I'm actually missing a summation point over here, but um, think of like uh, we're, we're summing over all of the um, pairwise points possible. Um, we are also using an entropic regularization for empirically better results. So what the empirical, uh, sorry, entropic regularization does is it allows us to split the correspondence probabilities between a larger number of uh, samples. And um, this uh, regularization constant epsilon and the number of neighbors k in KNN um, are the hyperparameters that our algorithms use. But um, we've seen through our experiments that the algorithm is pretty robust to the choice of K. So we're mostly tweaking epsilon here. And given the correspondence probabilities, what we do in order to visualize alignment and also to um, benchmark later on is project the points from domain X onto domain Y by uh, using barycentric projection. So barycentric projection does a weighted averaging of all points in Y uh, for point xi um, based on the correspondence probabilities between xi and the other points. So we applied Scott on both simulated data and also real world sequencing data. I will first show you alignment results qualitatively by visualization and then we'll give uh, quantitative benchmarking results later on. Um, here I'm showing you two data sets. The first one is a bifurcating tree resembling what we might observe in a cell differentiation situation. Each branch here represents a different uh, cell type. This data set was originally generated by the authors of the MMDMA paper. And the second one is a synthetic RNA-seq count data set we generated using a simulation tool called Splatter. Um, we also have three different cell types here. For each of these data sets, um, we have two domains and they have been both um, created by projecting a lower dimensional embedding onto different dimensional spaces. So we have one-to-one -one correspondence between the cells in each domain. Um, and this is true for both of the uh, data sets. But um, we don't use these correspondence information for alignments. We only use them for bench benchmarking later on. Here is the visualiz visualization of the alignments performed by Scott. At the top, we have the um, data points colored by cell type, and at the bottom, we have them colored by domain. As you can see, upon alignment, the global structure is uh, pretty similar between the domains, and the cell type clusters are also preserved. So next, we applied our method to real-world single-cell sequencing data sets. Um, but recall that for simulation data sets, we had sample-wise correspondence information to use for benchmarking. To have something similar here for the uh, sequencing data sets, we used uh, data from co-assaying uh, technologies. This means that we have two different types of measurements from the same single cells. Co-assaying technologies are limited, but there are a few available. Um, the first data set we have is uh, generated using SCGEM uh, technology, and that profiles gene expression and DNA methylation simultaneously on the same single cell. And the second one we have is from SNARE-seq. It does the same, but with uh, gene expression and chromatin accessibility. So we pre-processed both of these data sets according to the um, details in their original publication. And um, both of these data sets have a mixture of different cell types, but SCGEM also shows a continuous trajectory. And here are again, visualization of the alignment results um, by Scott. At the top, similarly uh, by cell type, and um, overall the cell type clusters are preserved, and at the bottom they're by domain. So so far, I've shown you some qualitative results uh, by visualization, but to quantitatively evaluate the alignments, we use the metric introduced by the MMDMA authors called FOXTTM, short for 
fraction of samples closer than true match. It uses this um, grand truth information we have on correspondences to assess the quality of alignments. Uh, so here's a visual exp expl explanation of how it works. Let's say we have these two domains to align, and this is the alignment that we obtain from the um, alignment algorithm that we have. So let's consider the green sample here. Its true match would be the other green sample from the other domain. But uh, after alignment, it's more closely located to two points out of all seven samples. So its Fox TTM would be uh, two over seven. So we compute this over all of the samples in both domains and average it, average it over um, both samples and domains to get one quantitative measure called average Fox TTM, uh, like one measure per alignment. And the lower values are better because ideally every point would be closely aligned with its true match um, and it would be zero. So we want Fox TTM measures as close to zero as possible. So here is a plot of average Fox CTM uh, for each data set after alignment with Scott, MMDMA, and Yinyukon. And the arrows point at the uh, best alignment results. Um, so Scott gives one of the best alignments across data sets. And for the first simulation, it's also pretty close to the Yinyukon uh, results. So far, the results that I've just presented you are based on alignments performed after hyperparameter tuning, just to show how well each method would perform in their best case scenario if they could perform hyperparameter tuning. But the realistic scenario is that a user may not have any validation data on correspondences uh, to use for the tuning procedure. Um, this is what we call a fully unsupervised setting. When we were looking into what we could do with this in the scenario, we realize that there is a relationship between Gromov-Wasserstein distance of the aligned domains and the alignment quality as measured by Fox CTM. The uh, alignment quality is here on the x-axis and the Gromov-Wasserstein distance is on the y-axis. It's in log scale for better visualization. Um, so as you can see, it's not a perfect measure, but given a data set uh, for better alignments, we tend to get better um, Gromov-Wasserstein distance between the aligned domains. And this is not really surprising because it is a measure for uh, the similarity. Um, so as a result, um, we developed a procedure to guide hyperparameter tuning based on gromov wasserstein distance uh, to be used in fully unsupervised settings. On the other hand, um, MMDMA and UnionCom do not have similar procedures for um, when no validation data set is available. So in a fully unsupervised setting, Realistically, one would perform alignment with them using their default parameters. So this is what we did. We also ran each method on the same data sets in the setting to demonstrate um, how they would compare to each other um, in a fully unsupervised scenario. So recall that this was the alignment quality graph from before. This is how it changes in the fully unsupervised setting. Um, as you can see, the hyperparameter settings actually significantly affect alignment results for um, all of these algorithms. Uh, but with Scott's procedure to guide hyperparameter selection, um, we're still able to receive uh, acceptable alignments, whereas uh, with default parameters, some of the alignments can be really terrible uh, for MMD main income. Lastly, we timed each method for a computational efficiency comparison. So UnionCom and MMDMA have their GPU versions implemented, and they're significantly faster than their CPU uh, versions, especially for UnionCom. And we thought that people would be uh, more likely to use their GPU um, implementations, so we use those. Uh, but for Scott, we actually only have a CPU implementation currently. Uh, so we compare these three. Um, we basically sampled an increasing number of samples from our largest data set, which was the synthetic RNA-seq data set we generated using Splatter. And then we timed each algorithm. But this does not um, include hyperparameter tuning time. Um, so UnionCom has some disadvantage here in terms of scalability, while MMDMA and Scott are pretty similar, with Scott showing some small, dis uh, small advantage over um, MMDMA. To sum up, um, we present a new and promising unsupervised algorithm for single cell um, 
multi-omic integration. And in the hyperparameter tuning scenario, it yields um, alignments that are comparable to the state-of-the-art unsupervised methods, MMDMA and Un Unicom, but it's also easier to use in an unsuper fully unsupervised setting where we cannot do hyperparameter tuning because uh, it has fewer hyperparameters and self-guide them, self-guide tuning them in um, fully unsupervised setting. And it's also um, computationally scalable compared to what's available out there. So we have our preprints on BioArchive and um, our code is also on GitHub. We have been working on uh, creating a documentation site using GitHub pages. It's still under construction, but you can check it out for more uh, details on documentation. I'd like to thank my collaborators for their hard work and mentorship in this project. And please feel free to ask me any questions. Um, I, I can see one question there. Yeah. So Mohit, do you wanna do you wanna say? Uh, yeah. So I have one question. So you had a graph where you compared uh, the performances of different methods when in, in the fully unsupervised case where mm -hmm. you cannot tune the hyperparameters. So I suspect you can select hyperparameters for your case by using the proxy distance. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, from a distance. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, what did you do for the other methods? For the yeah, so uh, we only use their um, default parameters because they they don't provide any sort of uh, way to select for hyperparameters when no validation data is available. So uh, we ran them in their default hi uh, hyperparameter settings. Okay. Um, but I think it's like one of the most realistic scenarios because after getting sequencing data from um, different aliquots, you actually will not have any correspondence information. Right, makes sense. Thank you. So and there are several questions in the Q&A uh, section. Yeah, 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 I'm seeing that, yeah. So um, uh, just to understand the intuition, um, in your cost function, uh, how does maximizing the entropy of the coupling ma ma matrix X on the, oh, wait a minute. So X as a regularizer. Over here. Yeah. 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 So it allows us to, um, without the entropic regularization, um, the algorithm will try to find with entropic regularization, um, the probabilities are split between a higher number of um, points for each sample from one domain to the other. Mm -hmm. So um, without the entropic regularization, um, if the highest probability is on the wrong cell, you will get a, an, an alignment that's like completely off compared to what it's supposed to be. But um, with entropic regularization, um, there is more averaging, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it also actually um, allows for faster computation. And that was shown by Marco Couturi in um, a paper titled, Synchron Distances, Light Speed Computation of Optimal Transport Distances. So if you're interested in the advantages for uh, computational spe speed, um, when using the entropy regularization, there's also that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question is um, about the, the value of K in KNN uh, graph. Mm -hmm. how, it, how does it affect uh, the alignment quality? Um, yeah, so I actually was, <laughs> um, can you see this? Uh, did the, did the um, screen change what I'm yeah. sharing? Okay. So we actually looked at that with different simulation scenarios. I'm just showing you an example. Um, but so we have different, um, this is the colors represent the uh, alignment quality. So we plotted that based on different epsilon values and number of neighbors, K. Okay? It changes by K, but it uh, epsilon affects a lot more. This is from an earlier uh, experiment that we had, but um, 
pay has some effect, but very minimal. Okay, great. Um, okay, I think we should uh, turn to the next uh, next to talk. It's already um, 11.43. Okay. I'll try to answer in the Q&A section. Thanks. All right. Okay. Um, the next uh, next presentation will be by um, Rosan uh, Rao on the transformer protein language models. Um, uh, they are unsupervised structure learners. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming to this talk. Um, I'm Roshan Rao. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. I'm happy to present our work on transformer protein language models are unsupervised structure learners that was done as part uh, of my work this summer at FAIR, along with Josh Meyer, Tom Sergio, uh, Sergio Chinnikov, and Alex Reeves. Um, can everyone see my screen? And this is all going correctly? Awesome. Uh, so our goal is going to be to predict protein contacts from the protein sequence. Um, and the traditional way of doing this is via something called direct coupling analysis, where we would attain a multiple sequence alignment uh, from a pairwise uh, or from a sequence database and attempt to infer edges in the corresponding pairwise Markov random field, uh, where each node in the Markov random field corresponds to a position in the sequence alignment. Um, so this was proposed uh, a couple years ago, um, and the one of the standard ways of doing this uh, inference is via pseudo likelihood maximization, where we try to infer weights of the edges in this Markov random field that maximize the probability of a residue at position i in a sequence, given the residues at all other positions in the sequence. And the learned pairwise weight matrix should then correspond to protein contacts. So there's been a lot of work uh, more recently around training a neural network directly on a protein sequence database. Um, so we want to ask the question is, can we actually infer protein contacts directly from this neural network without training that's not trained on protein structures? So to do this, we're going to specifically look at transformer protein language models. So transformers consist of multiple layers and each layer has different attention heads. Um, and each attention head learns a pairwise attention map for sharing information between positions in the sequence. So you can already see that there should be a correspondence between these attention heads, these pairwise attention heads, and the pairwise Markov random field that was used to, that's, that's traditionally used to learn protein contacts. Additionally, we optimize this transformer using uh, something called the mass language modeling loss, which is taken from natural language processing, but actually bears very strong similarities to the pseudo likelihood loss. So instead of maximizing the probability of a residue I given all of the other residues, we maximize the probability of masked residues given all unmasked residues. This is actually extremely structurally similar, and you can uh, use the mass language modeling loss in a, in a pairwise marker random field and also uh, learn protein contacts directly. So in order to uh, extract contacts from these models, well, extracting contacts from a pairwise MRF is pretty straightforward because the high values in the pa learned pairwise weight matrix actually correspond directly to protein contacts. So the question is, how do we extract contacts from a transformer? Well, our hypothesis is that trans the, just as the pairwise marker of random field learns contacts directly in its pairwise component, the weights, that the transformer should also learn contacts directly in its pairwise component, the attentions. The problem is that the transformer has multiple layers and multiple heads per layer. Um, in the transformer we spend a lot of time looking at uh, in this work, there are 33 layers and 20 attention heads per layer for a total of 660 distinct attention maps, not all of which are going to correspond to contacts. So which of these attention heads actually correspond or will actually correspond to protein contacts? 
So I'm actually going to sidestep this question for a little bit and then just look, pretend that we already know which attention heads correspond to protein contacts and take a look at, uh, at those attention heads. So this is the attention head from the, uh, the first head in the last layer of a particular train transformer. So this is actually just the raw attention map for that head. And we see that it already correlates fairly well with protein contacts. If we use the attentions from this head to do contact prediction, uh, then it actually achieves a long range precision at L of 55.2 on this particular sequence uh, without any pre-processing or any training on protein sequences. If we apply a little bit of pre-processing to it via symmetrization and then APC, then we see that this jumps up from uh, all the way up to 67.2. And throughout this whole process, the model is, again, not trained on any protein structures. If we then look at a couple more attention heads, uh, my slide doesn't seem to advance. OK, if we look at a couple more attention heads, um, then we see that actually multiple attention heads all seem to correspond to protein contacts. We also see that they seem to learn slightly different information. For example, if you look carefully at the third head in this sequence, we can see that there is, this seems to be learning short or medium range contacts. So it's long range precision at L is lower, but the short and medium range precision at L uh, should actually be somewhat higher. So why don't we just combine this information by taking an average over these attention heads? Now, if we average over, well, one attention head is just, uh, is not really an average. It's just what I was showing in the previous slide. Five attention heads is an average over exactly the five attention heads I was showing in the previous slide. And 10 attention heads is an average over an additional five attention heads that we think are, are predictive of protein contacts. Uh, and we see that, again, as we simply average over more and more attention heads, we see a, a significant increase in contact precision. Okay, but this kind of begs the question of how we're choosing which attention heads to average over and whether there's a more principled way of actually choosing these attention heads. Um, and the way we do it is by introducing a tiny amount of supervision here. Um, so we want to train this model via a sparse regression uh, where we're going to learn a single weight for each attention head in the transformer. And our hypothesis is that most attention heads are not strongly predictive of protein contacts. Uh, and so should uh, most of these weights that we learn should actually be zero. So this is our full learned uh, contact probability for the, entire, uh, uh, for the entire contact map. We learn one weight per attention head for a total of 661 weights because we have an additional uh, intercept term. Um, in, in, a, in, in the transformer that we spend most of this time looking at. Uh, most of those weights are driven to zero. Uh, and the sum over this weighted uh, average is passed into the logistic function to, to obtain contact probabilities. And then we can train this logistic regression on a small number of protein structures. And when I say small, I really mean a very small number of protein structures. Um, because the logistic regression has very few parameters and is strongly regularized and doesn't really need to learn that much information, we can actually just train this on a single protein structure. So this isn't the protein structure that it was trained on. It's trained on a different protein structure, but it's still able to have a precision at L of 82.4 on this particular sequence. If we train on a few more structures, we get slightly more robust uh, weights. Uh, and can increase this contact probability or, or this contact precision uh, up to 88 or 89.6 uh, as we train on 20 protein structures. And this seems to about be the cap of what this logistic regression model can do. Um, uh, and training on more than 20 protein structures does not significantly increase contact precision. So this is kind of the full uh, pipeline of our contact precision. We have a, a transformer that is pre-trained on a sequence database uh, to, to do mass language modeling. The weights of this model are then frozen and then passed, uh, and then the attention maps are passed after symmetrization and APC to a logistic regression, which is fine-tuned on a small number of protein sequences. So looking at some quantitative results, first of all, uh, let's talk about some baselines here. 
So the baseline that we're going to compare to is Gremlin. And Gremlin implements the pseudo likelihood based optimization uh, that uh, is, is standard for learning protein contacts uh, from sequences. And we compare to Gremlin in two settings. In the first setting, we're looking at Gremlin trained on multiple sequence alignments generated from the ESM training set, uh, which is the training set that our transformer used. And it's a subset of the uh, UNIREF 50. Uh, the second setting is Gremlin trained on uh, MSAs used in TR Rosetta. So TR Rosetta is a, a paper which achieves state-of-the-art results on CAS 13. Um, and it generates MSAs from UNIREF 100 uh, and additionally augments them with metagenomic sequences. And so we think this is, uh, represents approximately an upper bound in Gremlin's performance on these sequences. So we're going to evaluate Gremlin along with a number of different uh, transformer models on 14,000 uh, test structures after these transformer models are trained on 20 training structures. And so we're evaluating a number of different transformers here uh, that are trained by different groups on different data sets uh, with different parameters. But we see a pretty similar trends overall. Um, first of all, all of these transformers seem to learn uh, contacts in their attention maps directly. Um, additionally, we see a clear relationship between model scale and the ability to learn contacts in the attention map. So if we look at the 6, 12, and 34 layer ESM1 models, these models have very similar hyperparameters, are trained on the same training data set, and are trained until there is a convergence in validation perplexity. Um, and so we can see that precision at L, long range precision at L, increases steadily as we increase the scale of the model. We can also look at this ESM1B model. And what this is is actually slightly smaller than the ESM134 layer model. It has 33 layers and has 650 million parameters as opposed to 670 million parameters. However, it's been optimized in a sort of Roberta-like procedure to minimize validation perplexity by tuning a bunch of hyperparameters like learning rate, dropout, masking pattern, uh, and long range precision uh, and, and, uh, and layer norm. Uh, and so by tuning these hyperparameters, we can actually see that a smaller model is able to achieve a significant increase in contact precision. Looking at uh, some, of the, some of the simpler techniques for of extracting contacts that I was showing earlier, simply averaging over the top heads is still an extremely reasonable way of extracting contacts from this model. Uh, so when, when I say top K heads here, what we're at, the way we pick those heads is we train a logistic regression, and then we look at the heads that correspond to the top weight values of that regression we throw away the actual weight values and then simply take an average over those heads. We see that simply taking an average over the top 10 heads uh, is actually fairly competitive with Gremlin and that even one head achieves reasonable long range precision at L across this uh, data set. We also, again, don't really need to train on many protein structures. Simply taking uh, training on one protein structure and then evaluating on all 14,000 protein structures achieves performance that is quite comparable to Gremlin, while training on 10 or 20 structures uh, outperforms Gremlin, at least on average. So if we go a little bit more into depth, those were all uh, average results over a large uh, test set. So let's take a, a dive down and look at the actual distribution uh, across these 14,000 sequences. Um, so what I'm showing here is the full distribution of performance of ESM1B versus Gremlin. Uh, and each point here is colored by the log of the number of sequences and the alignment used to train Gremlin. So what we can see is that, again, when Gremlin is trained on ESM data, ESM1B generally outperforms uh, for predicting both short or, or all short, medium, and long range contacts. Uh, when it's trained on TR Rosetta data, ESM1B outperforms for short and medium range contacts. But for long range contacts, the dis distribution is much more mixed. So ESM1B has a higher long range precision at L for 55% of sequences. 
but that still leaves Gremlin outperforming ESM1B on 45% of sequences, which suggests that these are actually learning somewhat complementary pieces of information and that these could be useful uh, as, as a feature combination to a downstream supervised contact prediction pipeline. Uh, so this figure uh, breaks down the, the relationship between MSA depth and performance a little bit more clearly. Um, so again, when we look at Gremlin trained on ESM data, there's a clear perform uh, ESM1B clearly outperforms at all MSA depths. Um, what's particularly interesting though, is if we look at Gremlin trained on TR Rosetta data for a long range uh, contact precision, we see something that's actually very intuitive which is that Gremlin and ESM are perform extremely similarly when there are at least a thousand sequences in the MSA, which is the regime where we know Gremlin tends to perform very well. Uh, but when there are fewer than a thousand sequences in the MSA, ESM1B seems to perform significantly better than Gremlin. Uh, another result, which I actually think is really exciting, is the relationship between validation perplexity and long range contact precision. Um, and what we're showing here is the training trajectories of this model as uh, throughout pre-training history. Uh, so each point in this line uh, represents uh, a particular checkpoint of this model as it is training on UNRF 50 with mass language modeling. And we're comparing uh, the validation perplexity on a random split holdout of UNRF 50 to the average long range precision across our 14,000 protein uh, data set, uh, test set. And we see a pretty clear, almost linear relationship between validation perplexity and contact precision. So this suggests that driving down validation perplexity actually should directly uh, decrease or directly increase uh, contact precision, which is really exciting result for future scaling work. So as we get models that are larger um, or have better hyperparameters or, or are trained on more data, we should see there that they're able to drive down validation perplexity further and able to pick up on more and more protein contacts. Uh, another small caveat is that this, the ESM1B line is not actually comparable to the ESM lines because the masking pattern for the uh, language modeling training is different. And so these result in slightly different perplexity evaluations. Um, oops, sorry, here we go. Um, and so uh, the last kind of result that I want to look at is uh, if we want to generate new sequences, um, we can actually, we want to ask if, if we generate new sequences, uh, do these sequences actually preserve protein contacts? So we can do this by uh, masking out a uh, some fraction of the input sequence, say 20%, uh, filling in that input sequence using the model's predictions uh, of the amino acids, uh, and then repeat that process using the newly generated sequence. And we can restart this process uh, with some probability in order to prevent uh, the model from wandering off too far away from the original input sequence. So this probably doesn't generate particularly excellent uh, uh, sequences uh, because uh, uh, it um, doesn't have that many constraints on the generated sequence quality, but it generates a lot of sequences very quickly uh, which enables us to generate like a 10,000 protein pseudo MSA uh, that we can then plug into Gremlin in order to predict protein contacts. So if we do this uh, and do this across all of the 14,000 proteins that we test on, uh, it's definitely significantly worse uh, at extracting contacts than directly predicting uh, with either with Gremlin or with uh, ESM1B attention. So the long range precision at L from generating pseudo MSAs and then uh, passing those into Gremlin is only 14.5, uh, which is still higher than, for example, some of the uh, transformers uh, were able to, to predict. 
Um, however, it definitely succeeds quite well on some pr particular protein families. So for example, on this family through QHP, uh, what we're showing on the left are the true protein contacts. In the middle are contacts that are generated or, or predicted via our logistic regression model. And on the right are contacts that are, gen are predicted by Gremlin uh, when given this pseudo MSA. So kind of in summary, uh, transformers represent contacts directly via a sparse a subset of attention maps. Mass language modeling perplexity is an excellent proxy for contact precision. Better hyperparameters and bigger models will actually lead to better contact precision. Um, and the best models are competitive with uh, and even can outperform the existing bioinformatics pipeline. Um, and all of our models and regressions are, uh, or at least all of the ones that are trained on the ESM models are available uh, on GitHub now. So I want to say thanks to the uh, FAIR team, uh, Josh, Tom, uh, and Alex, uh, who worked with me directly, um, as well as uh, to uh, some others, Sergey, who also worked with me, and then Hustis, uh, Dalpris. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so just one question um, from uh, Anushri uh, Arora. Um, uh, is the masking done for just a single residue of the sequence or um, is it done for multiple continuous residues of the sequence? Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, if the masking at training time is done on 15% uh, of residues at random. Okay, um, and then a question from Li Xian: uh, Are the heads selected uh, tend to be tend to be from higher layers? Uh, yeah, so let me show. So this is a, a distribution of the uh, heads that are selected, uh, actually split up by um, training a logistic regression specifically to look at sh uh, very short range, uh, short range, medium or long range uh, protein contact. And we see that there's really two modes um, where most of the heads are either in the final four layers or final maybe five or six layers as well, uh, as well as a number of uh, layers in the middle, layers 14 through 20, actually seem to be quite predictive of protein contacts, which sort of leaves open what uh, the initial layers and these intermediate layers are doing. Okay. Um, does the increase the, in the in the number of heads help the performance? Um, I actually don't know that we have a um, uh, a result on that. Um, there's another paper uh, at iClear which looks at single layer attention heads um, that uh, I also worked on with Sergey, uh, and uh, that paper. Um, does have uh, a uh, uh, a tendency to uh, that paper does show that um, there is a relationship between the number of attention heads and uh, contact precision, but it's uh, not obvious that those uh, but those are only on single layers of attention as opposed to large models. Okay, all right. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, so, so we will have a uh, lunch break for um, about 35 minutes and then we will resume the uh, spotlight presentation at 1240. And then I'd like to remind you that we will have a poster session at the um, Gather Town website. And then um, I think Gerald uh, just, just posted the website um, on chat. You can find the link there. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. So um, see you at uh, twelve forty for this uh, for the spotlight.
All righty, everybody, uh, welcome back. Hope you had a great lunch. Um, I'm Gerald. I'll be co-chairing or chairing the uh, Spotlight session. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to give a quick 60 second introduction to Gather That Town for those of you who haven't used it yet. So for the, as was mentioned before the break, uh, we're using gather.town to do the poster and spotlight or the poster and the uh, social. And so you can find the link for gather.town off of the MLCB website over here. And so just to give you a quick tour, basically the way this works is that when you <clears throat> enter the gather.town website, you basically just need to uh, enter in your name up here. And what's going to happen is it's going to access your video and audio. And so when you join, basically you're going to enter in the poster session and you can already see there's 31 people there. Um, and so basically the main idea here is that you, this is supposed to basically simulate uh, like a real poster session. And so when you walk close to a poster, um, basically you'll see it appear on the, you'll see a small little, uh, like a preview of the poster appear on the bottom of the screen. And all you have to do to look at the full poster is hit X. And so when you hit X, basically you'll see a full screen uh, view of the poster and you can browse it. And so if the poster presenter is standing near the poster, uh, basically you'll see a picture of them and you'll be able to talk to them uh, just like normal. Um, you'll also see pictures of other people who are in close proximity to you. Um, and basically their, their video and audio will show up as they uh, get close to you and it'll disappear as, it, as they uh, walk away. And so basically the idea here is we've set up this poster room. You can walk around, check out different posters, talk to people. Um, in terms of the social, you can either meet people and talk to people in this poster room, or if you go to the bottom of the screen, you'll see this uh, little text here that says to the social room. And this will basically just take you to another room where it's just basically a wide open space. I mean, you, you can just randomly walk up to people and, and start talking to them. Uh, but that's it for the quick gather.town demo. Um, and so we're going to get started with the spotlight session. So uh, first up, should be Amrita Basim, UCSF. Uh, Amrita, are you here? Or is somebody who's supposed to be presenting the poster here? OK, I don't see you anywhere. So we'll just quickly go on to the next person. And if you happen to show up later, uh, just send me a message, and then I can put you back in sequence. So first up, then, will be uh, Lutfi from Paris Tech uh, talking to us about nonlinear post-selection inference for GWAS. Take it away, you Thank you, Gerald. Do you guys see my screen? Yeah, I see it. Perfect. So it's my pleasure today to present kernel of Psi, which is a post selection inference framework for nonlinear GWAS. The idea of kernel of Psi came from what you observed, which is the complete dichotomy between SNP level and gene level. What happens is that on um, the gene level, we have increased interpretability and biological relevance. On the other hand, we have also, for on the SNP level, we have annotations which can be interesting and offer a breadth of information. However, when we try to combine those two and we try to use those lead SNPs to derive gene level statistics, this leads to invalid inference. Basically, you are cheating by looking into the data twice. And this is where post selection inference comes into play by correcting for the initial selection bias. We start by selecting a model which depends on the outcome in supervised fashion. After that, we move to inference where we try to derive the distribution of statistic of interest. It can be anything that you want. For example, for post selection inference, most of the literature focuses on linear model. And one prominent example, the, whole, the thing that initiated the whole thing is when we try to derive the post selection distribution of a non coefficient for a selected feature in a lasso. If you try to go to the nonlinear case, this is not possible to do it in a closed form. And this is why we turn to sampling in kernel of Psi, where we sample replicas of the outcome to derive empirical distributions. We have shown how this post selection inference and framework leads to superior performance compared to non selective benchmarks. Uh, finally, I just want to say that kernel Psi is a powerful and scalable method for simultaneous step level selection and afterwards gene level inference. So broadly speaking, post-selection inference can be interesting to improve both interoperability and statistical power. 
And uh, for the broad community, we provide kernel upside as a tool available on GitHub on both CPU and GPU. So come visit my poster at booth 19. Thank you for your attention. Great, thanks Luffy. Um, next up, we have Hossein uh, Mousin from Yale, who will talk to us about neural net interpretability using activation tuning and personalized products. All right, so uh, hello everyone. I'm Hussein, and I'll be briefly describing two complementary approaches pertaining to neural network interpretability. Uh, the first of which is activation-based neural tree tuning, which is a Darwinian approach where the, like, the fittest neurons will survive training while others will be removed during the process. Um, our original hypothesis was that we can find a way to keep just enough neurons to maintain the predictive power of the network but also we can remove ones that might collectively be injecting noise and rendering the network less interpretable. As for the criteria we use to uh, remove or keep a neuron, uh, it's based on what I'll describe as the training activity of a neuron measured through the magnitude of its gradient updates. It turns out we can proactively estimate this magnitude using target distributions that we designed to maximize the gradients for each separate activation function. On each tuning step, what we do is that we measure how close a neuron's inputs to the target distribution are. The higher this value is, the higher the gradient updates will be, and accordingly, the more likely the neuron is to survive the training process. Prediction and predictive informants uh, performance are not the goal, but we measured and assessed the effect of A and T on predictions in three different tasks, amnest, drug targets for uh, um, leukemia, and diabetes hospital readmission. And we noticed that we can remove 70% of the first hidden layer neuron in a two layer uh, fully connected network and still not jeopardize the predictive performance. And similar results were obtained when removing up to 50% of both uh, hidden layers of the network. As for the second approach, which is uh, the personalized weight products or PWP, um, it's an approach that calculates feature attributions to predictions using a post hoc summation of the outgoing weight paths in the trained network multiplied by a data subset that can range anywhere from a single data point to an entire data set, hence allowing for an efficient calculation of both global and data point specific attributions. To assess PWP, we first compared the features it prioritizes when acting on the complete trained network to those selected by the Gorsen's algorithm, another method that uses weight matrix multiplication. And we noticed that PWP selects a higher number of biomedically salient features in both the AML and the diabetes tasks. Lastly, we examined the personalized attributions on the MNIST dataset, uh, whether we give the method input the entire amnest data set, each digit separately, or only a pair of images pertaining to the same digit. And we realized that PWP applied on the AMT specified networks, uh, select the key edge features of each of the digits being fed as input, but also of the specific images uh, being received by the network. Uh, for more details, I'm more than happy to answer your questions and please uh, feel free to visit our poster during the session. Thank you. Great, thanks, Hussein. Um, next up, we have Makund uh, Sundarjan from NYU, uh, who will talk about insights into RNA splicing using interpretable ML techniques. All right, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yep, it's good. Okay, great. All right, hey guys, I'm Mokun from NYU, and I'm gonna be talking about novel insights into RNA splicing from interpretable machine learning. Uh, one of the most important processes that mRNA undergoes is splicing. Uh, during this process, introns are removed from the transcript and the remaining exons are joined. Uh, splicing is dictated by the so-called splicing code, which maps sequences to splicing decisions. Uh, exons and introns contain splicing motifs, which are short sequence patterns that play a key role in splicing decisions and are not well understood. Uh, in this illustration, for example, AGGA promotes splicing. Uh, so how would one typically approach this problem? 
Uh, typically, a convolutional neural network is fit to the data. They're often amenable for motif discovery as they consist of short filters that slide along a sequence. Uh, these filters help learn a parametric function that maps a sequence to a particular outcome, in this case, a splicing decision. Uh, but hang on, there's a major issue with reading motifs off of convolutional filters. Uh, the set of convolutional filters learned is highly fragile. If you train your model several times using different bootstraps of the data, you're gonna end up with different filters. Uh, in fact, we even saw in our experiments that several motifs don't always show up. Uh, just shuffling the same data results in, you know, in different filters. Uh, so which of these trained models should we use to discover motifs? Are motifs learned from these filters biologically meaningful if they're not reproducible? It's hard to tell. Uh, so what can we do about convolutional neural networks missing important motifs? Uh, well, here's one way to think about the problem. Assume each filter is drawn from some latent embedding space of motifs. Every time a network is trained, filters are sampled randomly from this space. In any given training run, convolutional filters associated with a single motif may or may not appear in the model. In our experiment, we find that simply increasing the number of filters doesn't change this behavior. So how can, we ch how can we capture as many unique motifs as possible? Here's what we do. First, we bootstrap the training data set several times and then fit a convolutional model to each resample. Uh, using the bootstrapped convolutional models, we generate an embedding vector for every filter in the model and group filters by similarity. Uh, then a representative filter is chosen in each group by selecting the one that has the highest average similarity with other filters in its group. Uh, now let's look at some empirical methodology, uh, sorry, empirical results using our methodology. Uh, using data from a high throughput slicing assay, we identified six important motifs. Our method was crucial in identifying these motifs as individual models typically fail to identify one or two of these strong motifs. Uh, we were able to recover these missing motifs as our algorithm aggregates unique motifs ac across bootstraps. Uh, so in conclusion, we recommend practitioners don't attempt to interpret any single neural network model. Rather, to get re reproducible results, bootstrap your data and refit models to each bootstrap. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Please check out our poster and abstract. Great, thanks. Uh, next up, we have Morteza Saber from the University of Montreal on identifying causal variants using predictors of microbial phenotype from genotype. Hello, thank you. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, as, um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher from Montreal University, and my work is on evaluating the uh, feature selection accuracy in bacteria in machine learning based bacterial genotype to phenotype mapping. Uh, mapping the relationship between genomic content of bacterial pathogen and its phenotype is essential to precision medicine. However, this process is challenged by multiple confounding factors such as population stratification and genome-wide linkage security barrier. So far, there have been two main approaches to solve this problem. First uh, has been the genome-wide association study or GWAS, in which uh, these confounding factors is explicitly uh, adjusted and controlled for. And recently, we have machine learning models, which despite getting very good accuracy, do not explicitly adjust for this confounding factor. So our question was here was that whether uh, this machine learning model are actually capable of identifying and adjusting for this confounding factor, or they are just prone to uh, identify the spurious associations that might exist due to these confounding factors. So to evaluate this hypothesis, we first developed a simulator called Bakshivasim, which simulates bacterial population using a coalescent model and bacterial phenotype using an additive genetic model. And in the first step if by is simulating bacterial population across a range of evolutionary scenarios. We first benchmark different GWAS-based uh, bacterial genotype to phenotype mapper, and we identified that uh, the linear mixed models are, are the best uh, GWAS tools for bacterial genotype to phenotype mapping. And we use this model as the reference for benchmarking different machine learning models. If in the beginning, instead, we uh, started with different uh, regression-based and tree-based machine learning models. And the result, and we found that uh, across a range of sample size and evolutionary scenarios, uh, while there is a big variation in the performance of different machine learning models, certain types of machine learning models are capable to identify and adjust for these confounding factors as good or even slightly better than that of uh, the best performing GWAS approaches. And we also noticed that while there is a variation for identifying the low effect size versus high effect size causal markers across all these uh, methods, uh, the machine learning models are, uh, are capable to identify the small effect size causal marker better than that of GWAS 
uh, better than the best performing GBOS uh, approaches. So this work is on the progress and we are uh, adding the different uh, deep learning models as well. And for further information, please uh, visit the poster number 21. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, next up, we have Johannes Linder from UW, uh, who will be talking about inferring nonlinear feature attributions with scrambling neural nets. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. <clears throat> and um, so yeah, I will quickly present a feature attribution method for biological sequences that is based on learning uh, input perturbations. So the task here is to attribute a neural network prediction to its input features, so figure out which part of the input uh, consists of the most salient features for the particular prediction. There are many choices of attribution methods for sequences. So in silico mutagenesis, deep lift, chap, et cetera. And you know, depending on the, the particular sequence predicted task, sequence attribution can be quite challenging. Uh, there are two uh, particular challenges I want to highlight here, is, which is you know, saturation effects that can occur in the neural network. I started to cut you off, but I think you have some serious echo. Do you have two? Devices. There are many choices of attribution methods. For... Huh. Is it better now? Or hello? And, you know, it sounds like on... somebody's playing YouTube in the background. Uh, that is not me. <laughs> Anshul, do you know how to mute everybody except for Johannes? Oh, there we go. Yeah, sounds better. Oh, yeah, great. Go ahead. All right. Uh, hopefully you heard uh, some of it. Oh, sorry. No, I can't see my. Sorry, can you see my screen still? Or uh, no, just reshare. Sure. <laughs> you need to you, you yeah. can you can also just start from the beginning if you like. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, trying to attribute a neural network prediction to its input features, and there are many possible choices of attribution methods. There are two big uh, potential challenges. Uh, you can have saturation effects that can occur inside of a neural network that can hide important regulatory motifs. And you can have feature independence assumptions that many feature attribution methods rely on that can break. So here we're looking at a particular uh, example of a five prime UTR sequence. And we have a neural network predictor that is trained to predict translational efficiency given the five prime UTR sequence as input. Now in this particular example, we have an in-frame start codon marked in red on the left side in the sequence and a stop codon marked in blue on the right side. Together, these two form a NAND-like type of rep repression because they create an upstream open reading frame. So this is a weak 5 prime UTR. And the neural network can, can predict this very well. However, <clears throat> by inserting multiple stop codons into the sequence, we create sort of a saturation effect where the uh, effect of the stop codon is hidden from an in silico uh, mutagenesis visualization method shown below. So to get, to get around this, we take a different approach where we instead try to learn good sequence attributions by perturbations. So the idea is to train an autoencoder network that we hear called a scrambler that is trained to reconstruct and find the smallest set of features inside of the sequence that preserve the original prediction. So in essence, we let the scrambler tr uh, output a sequence PWM for each input sequence, after which we pull discrete samples from this PWM and feed it to the predictor model. And we then optimize the scrambler such that sequences pulled from this PWM reconstruct the original prediction of the unscrambled sequence. At the same time, we try to maximize the entropy of the sequence PWM, hoping that we're only going to find the most important feature set. And this approach builds on earlier feature selection methods, but whereas previous methods have used perturbations such as fading, blurring, or zeroing out on important dimensions, we uh, either raise or lower the temperature. That's essentially what the scrambler predicts at each nucleotide position in this PWM. And that is, as we show uh, in, in the poster, uh, leads to much better performance for uh, biolog biolog uh, sequence predictive models. And so again, if we look at the 5 from UTR sequence, after having trained the scrambler on data, it can easily detect both the start and the stop codons uh, for this example. And if you want to hear more, we're located over there where the star is, and we're close to 10. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, next up, we have Jack Lanchenton from the University of Virginia, uh, who will talk to us on transfer learning with neural motif transformers for predicting protein-protein interactions between SARS-CoV-2 and humans. Can you hear me? 
Yep, sounds good. All right, cool. Yeah, so this is joint work with uh, my lab mate Arsh Deep and professors Clint Miller and Yan Jun Chi. So, um, a protein protein interactions and it's a process where two proteins come in contact with each other to carry out specific biological functions. And these, these interactions between two human proteins are subject to attack by virus proteins, which is how the virus overtakes physiological functions. Um, when a novel virus such as the 2019 coronavirus or also known as SARS-CoV-2 attacks the human body, the problem is we don't initially know which proteins it'll interact with. And this presents a few problems. The first being that if we assume there are around 20,000 human proteins and 26 virus proteins in the case of the coronavirus, this results in uh, half a million potential interactions. And while mass spec techniques can find many of these interactions, uh, it's impossible to directly test all potential interactions. So computational methods are necessary if we want to actually look at all possible interactions. Um, and the second problem is that this task is specifically difficult for testing a novel virus since there's limited or no interaction data um, for that virus. So our training data is consists of only human-human interactions and human-virus interactions from previous virus proteins. So while some of these might be similar, um, it probably doesn't transfer directly to the new virus protein. So in this paper, we introduce a new model that we call the motif transformer, designed specifically for in silico prediction between a novel virus and a human protein. So given a virus protein and a human protein, uh, our model gives a prediction of how likely these are to interact. And to uh, fix this problem of this uh, um, training testing um, issue where we don't have any training data for the novel virus, we propose a transfer learning approach where the model learns general protein representations in order to better generalize uh, for testing novel virus protein interactions. Um, so we see on several data sets, including our own curated data set from SARS-CoV-2 proteins that our approach particularly using transfer learning outperforms previous methods for novel virus interaction prediction. Um, so I'll be presenting at paper fit poster 50 during the poster session. That's it. Great, thanks. Uh, next up we have Sanjit Batra from Berkeley, uh, who'll talk about learning putative causal gene regulatory programs. Hi, can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, in silico epigenome editing. This is joint work with Jeffrey Spence and Yun Song at Berkeley. Um, so CRISPR-Cas9 systems can help cure monogenic disorders uh, whenever the underlying mutation is known, for instance, in sickle cell anemia. However, uh, if the disease is caused by gene expression reduction, but we don't know the under underlying mutation, we might want to use epigenome editing. Um, However, the question now is where do we edit the epigenome? Uh, in order to answer this question, we train a model that predicts gene expression from epigenetic tracts. Um, to build such a model, we use the publicly available ENCODE data uh, that assays many different epigenetic markers across many different cell types. Um, inspired by the Deep Chrome paper in 2016, we have a similar setup where for each gene, we center a window at the TSS of that gene and consider many different histone modifications as the epigenetic markers, binned at 100 base pair resolution uh, and predict the gene expression level. In contrast to the deep, deep Chrome paper, which does binary classification of the gene expression value, we predict the, directly the gene expression value in a TPM. Um, and furthermore, in the Deep Chrome paper, they predict, uh, they build separate models for each cell type. Uh, however, since correlations invariant across cell types are less likely to be spurious, we treat each gene in each cell type as an independent data point and build a single model across all the different cell types. Uh, the data set that we have uh, corresponds to these 12 cell types and these six histone marks. Uh, once we train a model, we get a Pearson correlation of about 0.65 across the different cell types on uh, held out chromosomes. Um, Similar to in silico mutagenesis in sequence-based models, we can perform in silico epigenesis uh, with the trained model where we slide peaks of uh, different epigenetic tracts to, to measure their impact on the gene expression level. Uh, in particular, here's a representative gene where the x-axis is the position in the input context and the y-axis is predicted gene expression. Uh, if we consider the dark blue line corresponding to the A3K27 acetylation, we see that as we slide an artificial peak along the input context, we see 
that the gene expression increases maximally when the peak uh, is associated at the TSS. Um, once we are, are convinced that the model picks up reliable biology, we would like to understand how to propose epigenome edits with such a trained model. Uh, in order to do so, we set up an optimization problem similar to activation maximization in computer vision, inspired by the recent Lididi paper. And we asked uh, the model to increase the gene expression of a representative gene. And here again, we, we see on the x-axis, the position in the input context of a, of a gene, and the y-axis, the chain in the epigenetic features uh, when we ask the model to increase this gene's expression. Uh, and what the model does is places peaks of S3K27 acetylation and A3K4 ME3 at the TSS in the dark blue and the pink line. Uh, it also places peaks of A3K36 trimethyl all along the gene body in the red track. And it re removes peaks of A3K9 ME3 uh, in the brown track all along the gene body. Uh, we're now working with collaborators to verify whether these epigenome edits can be validated in vitro. Uh, if you'd like to chat more, please come see me at Poster 40. Thank you. Thanks, Sanjit. Uh, last up, we have Andre Duke from Utah State University. We'll talk about visualizing high dimensional and high frequency electrical biosignals. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Andres Duque, uh, and the title of our work is Visualizing High Dimensional and High Frequency Electrical Biosignals. And basically, the goal of our work is uh, to recover a low dimensional representation of high dimensional dynamical systems and be able to visualize in two or three dimensions the behavior of possible latent factors that are driving the, pro the process. So here we have a, a little outline of, of the problem setup. Basically, we assume that there are latent variables confined in a low dimensional manifold that are driving the, the high dimensional process. And the way we tackle the problem is, is to split the data in several time windows. And what we want to do is for each time window to try to find a, a latent representation of, of the process over that time window. So our approach is uh, based on uh, a distance introduced in empirical intrinsic geometry by Talmon and, and Koifman, which is basically a Mahalanobis distance computed of, over histograms of data. And we mix it together with the fate manifold learning algorithm, which is based in, in diffusion geometry, but has shown to, to be more stable to, to compute embeddings in two or three dimensions that, than diffusion maps, for example. Uh, and we also introduce some information geometry distances in the context of diffusion operators, operators which usually are, are computed in diffusion maps. We usually try to compute the Euclidean distance, uh, Euclidean distances in, in diffusion operators, but, but here we uh, try with another uh, distances uh, motivated by information geometry. So here are some results of our, our algorithm. And here we compute uh, our approach for EEG signals, and we try to analyze uh, sleep dynamics. So as, as you can see here, we are basically able to find a latent representation that not only allows us to visualize, diff visualize different sleep dynamics uh, and sleep stages, but we also can see clear paths and trajectories that uh, uh, are happening uh, 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 over time. And you can analyze how, how the patient of the subject that from where, from who you are measuring, um, is is changing uh, across time in, in different sleep stages. Here we also try with e EMG signals uh, annotated by hand gestures, and here as well we are able to to separate the different labels and visualize how the process is 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 behaving. So, for example, here we see how uh, a subject starts with the hand at rest performs a radial, radial deviation and then goes back to the HANA rest. Uh, so yeah, basically that's uh, our work. We are in poster nine and, and hope to see you there. Thank you. Great, so that's it for the Spotlight presentations. Um, I posted a link to the gather.town uh, platform in the chat window. You can find it on the mlcv.github.io page as well. Um, I just want to point out one uh, specific feature of the Gather Out Town uh, platform. And so if we just quickly go back to the Gather Out Town uh, site, um, if, you, if you get lost, because there's a lot of posters here, there's about 48 of them, uh, you'll notice in the center of this room, there's a 
there's a little poster board called poster or, or called poster list. And so if you hit X on this poster list, uh, you'll basically get a map of the entire poster room and a list of all the titles on the right. Um, so I've added short titles um, above each poster. You can find the full uh, poster titles on the right. And so you can use this to find the posters that you want uh, when you get in there. And that's about it for the spotlight session. So hope to see you guys in the poster session. I'm going to shut down the Zoom call now. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, see you tomorrow. I mean, see you at the poster session, and then see you tomorrow on Zoom. Bye-bye. <clears throat>